Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again today to this uh, wonderful conference, uh, the Nova Migra Budapest Conference on Populism and Migration. This conference is organized by the John Wesley Theological College, and this event is part of the Nova Migra project sponsored by the European Union. A busy day ahead of us, so we better start. Our first speaker today is uh, Francois Boucher, who will give two presentations, one presentation now and one at the end of this today's conference. So I'll ask him to get, deliver his presentation. Okay, so first I, I would like to thank the uh, organizer for this wonderful invitation and opportunity to discuss the topic um, of immigration and populism here uh, in Hungary. So what I'm, going to, what I'm going to do today is to present a report that I wrote last year as part of my involvement in the Nova Migra uh, uh, project. And so th this task was part of a larger task where the members of the team uh, attempted to, to compare anti-immigration discourse on the one hand in different countries and do, to do the same thing on pro-immigration discourse. So today I'm focusing on the anti-immigration discourse, focusing on the case of France. And of course the main, uh, uh, um, oh, sorry. And of course the main, uh, 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 so the main actor that uh, uh, supports this anti-immigration and populist discourse uh, uh, in the context of France is the far-right political party, uh, uh, the Front National, which, uh, uh, as you know, has been renamed Rassemblement National in, in 2017. And so the goal was more specifically to look at anti-immigration discourse before and after the so-called uh, refugee and migrants uh, uh, crisis. So before and after 2015 to see if there are any changes in the evolution of this uh, uh, discourse. So uh, what I did, however, for uh, uh, the time frame was to start in 2011, because for the Front National, something very, very significant happened in 2011. Namely, there was a change of the leadership of the party. So Jean-Marie Le Pen, uh, who had been uh, uh, the leader of the Front National since uh, 1972, uh, uh, resigned. And uh, his daughter, Marine Le Pen, became the head uh, of the Front National in 2011. And with this change of leadership came a, a, a certain narrative of, of a, a, main, a new era for the Front National, which allegedly had become more mainstream, more respectable, more tolerant, and more like other regular parties. So not anymore a fringe party, but a mainstream political party. And so one of the big question uh, uh, in this research was to take this topic of it, the change in the content of the discourse and policy of the Front National to see if this is really something meaningful, if there was really a change uh, towards uh, uh, the mainstream. And so what I'm going to do today is discuss about the certain numbers of discursive strategies that Marine Le Pen, the head of the, 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 the Front National, has taken to sustain this myth of the so-called de-demonization of the Front National. Uh, so I'll say a, a few more words about this later. And so what, what I did was to look at official discourses from Marine Le Pen, uh, the official party platforms of the, or the programs from 2012 and the 2017 presidential elections. Uh, those are very important and substantial uh, documents. Uh, I looked a little bit at some intellectuals that are not necessarily linked to directly to the, the Front National, but uh, uh, partake to this uh, uh, right-wing ecosystem in the French landscape. And of course, I looked at a lot of secondary uh, uh, literature uh, in the works of people like uh, uh, Valérie Igounet, Gregory Kaufman, uh, uh, and especially there, there are a couple of books by a, a social linguist called Cécile Aldui. They were very useful, especially this last one, because she performed lexicometrical analysis uh, uh, to see like the relative frequency of certain words, what are the topics that uh, uh, comes up a lot uh, uh, in the official corpus of, of party leaders, including Marine Le Pen, but she also compared this with, with other uh, uh, party leaders. Um, so I, I looked at all those sources, again, to sort of assess the myth uh, uh, 
that the Front National had become a mainstream uh, uh, political party. And I tried to, spe uh, to, to, to pay special attention to the year or the period around 2015 uh, uh, to see if there was some kind of significant change uh, uh, in the discourse of, of the Front National. So basically, I'm going to discuss, as I said, four discursive strategies that have been taken by Marine Le Pen. Uh, uh, the first has been like a general effort to, to distantiate herself from her father, the former leader of the Front National. The second has to do with the adoption of a, a form of populism that uh, uh, is not so rooted in ethnic identity, national identity, and so on and so forth, but in a discourse about the, the material or socioeconomic interest of the people, so something that is more akin to a left-wing uh, uh, populism. Um, I looked at another discursive strategy we could call the euphemization uh, uh, in the way she used different uh, types of languages. Uh, I, I will clarify what I mean by this. And uh, uh, the fourth has to do with a various processes of, of retortion. Again, I will explain what I mean by this. And towards the end, I will also mention a couple of external factors that have contributed with this, to this view that the Front National is now a mainstream party. Uh, so namely, what we could call the rightification of the right. So, so the fact that the whole political spectrum on the center right to the right moved farther to the right, especially on immigration issues, uh, especially around 2015. But this is something that had already started in the Sarkozy years, uh, uh, I believe. Uh, uh, and finally, there was a, a uh, um, in the 2017 uh, presidential campaign, especially a sort of dissemination of the populist style of doing politics with figures like, like Jean-Luc uh, Mélenchon. So this contributed sort of to the blurring effect of, of, uh, 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 of seeing the Front National as a party as uh, uh, any others. <clears throat> so um, as I said, uh, uh, the starting premise of this research is that there is an alleged shift in 2011. So this is uh, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen. So the father was the leader since 72, resigned in 2011. And with this change of figure, you see uh, uh, Marine Le Pen, who arrives as a new leader, claiming to be less virulent, more tolerant, less anti-Semitic, and so on and so forth, uh, and, and sort of uh, uh, projecting an image of, of uh, 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 reasonableness and so on uh, 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 and so forth. And so those two pictures are indeed quite telling. This picture is uh, uh, of Marine. Sorry. I was changing the slides uh, on my laptop uh, and I forgot. Uh, so if I do this again, just, just yeah. Sorry. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, uh, Jean Marie Le Pen, so angry old man shouting uh, 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 racial slurs uh, uh, at the Jews and then. Marine Le Pen, uh, she loves cats. Uh, this was a picture in an interview that she gave in the magazine uh, uh, Marianne. And this is really telling of the kind of public image that she was trying uh, uh, to project. But so this is, I, I don't want to make too much of those uh, uh, images. Let me then start by uh, uh, qualifying the kind of politics that the old Front National, the Front National of Jean-Marie Le Pen, was uh, engaging uh, as a form of national populism or identity populism. So this is a typology that has been established by uh, uh, Pierre-André Pierre -André Taguieff and the historian uh, uh, Michel Vinoc, for instance. Uh, uh, both of them contrast two kinds of populism. The first can be called contestatory populism. We can also call it left-wing populism, if you will. So this idea is uh, uh, that populism is a political discourse that has a vertical uh, a structure. It opposes the masses, the people at the bottom, and the corrupted elites uh, uh, at the top. And it also emphasizes this idea uh, uh, that elites have driven us away from direct forms of democracy, that the institution of representative Democracies have been subverted by powerful people who are able to take uh, advantage of them uh, um, and are not really giving a voice uh, uh, to the people. <clears throat> uh, and in, in this form of contestatory populism, the people is not 
is simply a demos, like it's the community of citizens who are all subjected to the same uh, 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 political power, right? They are the subject of the state. Uh, it's not necessarily an ethnos, an ethnic group uh, that's very important, and their interests tend to be defined in terms of, of socioeconomic uh, uh, interest. Whereas in identity populism, you still find those two components, right? The, the struggle of the people against the elites, a strong uh, Rousseauist conception of democracy, that there should be better channels to directly express the will of the people, uh, something that uh, 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 representative uh, parliamentary institutions are not doing, according to them. Uh, but in addition to this, you find an ethnic definition of the people, or a strongly culturalist definition of the people. So it's the, the political community is no longer just the community of citizens who are all subjected to the same power, the same authorities, the same laws, and so on and so forth. They are a ethno-cultural group who share a common descent, uh, certain cultural traits, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And so their claim is that corrupted elites ignore cultural anxieties of the ordinary people, uh, 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 <clears throat> despise ordinary people, and don't understand the value of, of cultural integrity, and so on uh, and so forth. And because of this, they are able to depict immigration as a main threat, as something that is an instrument in the hands of the corrupted transnational financial and, and elites and whatnot to undermine uh, uh, the very fabric of, of society. <clears throat> and so, in the years of Le Pen the father, uh, we can clearly see that he adopted uh, what I call uh, national populism or identity populism. Actually, Pierre Anguier Tagiev built this concept of, of, of uh, uh, identity uh, uh, populism by anal analyzing uh, uh, the discourses of, of, of Jean Marie Le Pen. So you clearly see in his discourse appeals to the identity interest of true native French. Uh, uh, he presented himself as the defender of the indigenous of this country, right? les indigènes de ce pays, the autochthonous, uh, of course claims that immigration threatens the racial, cultural, and moral purity of the nation. Uh, uh, and and in, in some very strong quotes, uh, you can see him saying some things like, immigration threatens our very substance, our biological substance, or moral and spiritual uh, substance, something uh, very strong. Uh, uh, the motto that, that uh, uh, he put forth in many political campaigns was the French first, les Français d'abord. Uh, um, and he used this to accuse the elites of preferring stranger. Like he has this term, la préférence étrangère, the preference for stranger. So he named it as if it was a thing, something that was a big deal uh, uh, in the political landscape uh, uh, of France. And so uh, it was a common topic uh, uh, in his discourse that migrants and immigration was the root cause of all sorts of problems, delinquency, uh, uh, unemployment, uh, uh, crisis in social housing, uh, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> uh, so for instance, this is a very famous uh, uh, slogan or poster uh, uh, in the 70s. It was one million, oh no, again. So yeah, so this is what I was, uh, Telling you, so uh, Le Pen, the father, uh, the identity, immigration threatens, uh, uh, the purity, and so on and so forth. And what I want to show to illustrate this idea of a, a, um, that migration is the root cause of all sorts of social problems is this very famous uh, uh, poster that uh, one million immigrants equals one million unemployed. So the first poster on the left was uh, from the 70s or early 80s. And, and in the 90s, like the number just increased, so now it was three millions uh, uh, unemployed equals uh, three millions uh, uh, immigrants. Uh, and then you have the slogan, uh, uh, France and the French first. So this idea that we need to give a preference to the true French. Good. Um, this came with uh, uh, attacks on multiculturalism. Uh, uh, one quote that, that uh, uh, is often uh, uh, taken by many uh, uh, other people on the far right was that 
multicultural societies or multi-conflictual societies. Uh, of course, uh, Le Pen was also a, a, a denier of, a denier of, of, the, uh, uh, of the Shoah, um, made uh, use a language that was often very violent with a, a military imagery, uh, depicted, for instance, uh, Algerian as a sixth column in French uh, uh, that were so numerous, and instead of giving numbers, he, he quantified them in, in terms of 500 infantry battalion capable of launching an urban uh, uh, guerrilla, and so on. So th those were the kind of statement that uh, uh, he was making. <clears throat> Good. So this brings me to my uh, uh, first point, the first discursive strategy that Marine Le Pen uh, uh, has taken uh, when she uh, uh, arrived at the head of the party. Uh, she clearly tried to uh, distantiate herself from her father by completely dropping this very virulent language, uh, especially the one with a, a military imagery, for instance. Uh, um, she tried to appear a bit more professional, more reasonable, as I said. She clearly rejected uh, uh, the anti-Semitism of her father, <clears throat> uh, for instance, uh, explicitly saying that, that she recognized uh, uh, that the Holocaust was real, that was a, a great act of barbarianism, for instance. Um, in the uh, 2014 uh, Euro election campaign, she excluded a certain numbers of candidates who hold racist views, especially anti-Semitic views, uh, and ultimately she ended up expelling her father from uh, the party after he made other uh, 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 references uh, uh, denying the importance <laughs> of, of the Holocaust. And so she, because of this, she was able to get what we could call certain social acceptability gains. So the support for the FN uh, in this period rose from 15 to 30 percent. It was not the first time in the history of the FN that the support was as high as 25 of, of 30, but there was a, a, a sudden bump like in, in the early uh, uh, 2010s. Um, and even uh, in this period, over 50% of the French started to say that the Front National was a party like the others. So not the fringe, not an extremist party, not a party on the far right, but just a party that is at the right of the political spectrum. Right? You can disagree with them, but they are a, a legitimate voice uh, 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 <clears throat> in the public. Uh, and they made several uh, electoral uh, advances. The most uh, striking was probably the fact that Marine Le Pen went to the second round of the uh, presidency election in uh, 2017. <clears throat> Good. So this is for the, the first uh, uh, discursive strategy, as I said. And this uh, repudiation of, of the anti-Semitism of her father sort of enabled her to appear as someone more tolerant, more open to diversity, and so on and so forth. But when you take a closer look at the concrete policy proposal that you find especially in, in the two uh, uh, political uh, uh, programs in 2012 and 2017, uh, uh, you can clearly see uh, uh, that there is still this, the, cons the, the core elements of, of national populism, of identity populism, namely uh, uh, that uh, uh, she relied on an ethnic or culturalist conception of the people, which purity is threatened by uh, uh, immigration. She adopted of course, the language of the invasion uh, of immigrants um, adopted also the language of the Great Replacement, which we discussed a little bit uh, yesterday, saying things like multiculturalism has tried to replace who we, were, who we are. It is the profound rejection of who we are. <clears throat> uh, she expressed also worries over the demographic capital, so namely the, the fact that uh, uh, people that she labeled the true French have a lower uh, 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 birth rate than uh, uh, immigrants, for instance. So this is linked to the great replacement thesis, uh, uh, of course. Um, and, and in those two uh, uh, party programs for the, the two uh, presidential election, you can still see immigration as being depicted as the, the first cause of several social problems, such as the ecological problem, housing crisis, national debt, lack of services, and so on and so forth. Uh, so basically, what I'm trying to say is that this whole 
idea of a de-demonization of, of the Front National is something uh, quite superficial when we look uh, into uh, the details. Uh, one thing that was uh, particularly striking also in both programs is this principle of national preference, uh, uh, which uh, expressed itself in, in several policy proposal that would deny social benefits to immigrants or children of immigrants. So for instance, there was this idea of denying family allowances to families in which both parents are not born in France, uh, to give preferential hiring uh, for native French, um, uh, to give priority to French person in the allocation of social housing. Uh, there was this idea of, of, of expatriation of delinquents with dual citizenship. Uh, the total suspension of, of family reunification uh, uh, migration, uh, the suppression of, of, of state support for uh, uh, medical insurances for uh, uh, immigrants, and a drastic reduction in the acceptance of, of uh, asylum of, of uh, demands. <clears throat> so a second discursive strategy that Marine Le Pen has taken in those years was to try to shift away from what I called identity populism to rely a little bit more on what I've called contestatory populism. So namely this view that the struggle of the real people is more of an economic struggle than a cultural struggle to preserve the, the identity uh, uh, of France. So she uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in the, the lexicometrical analysis of, of Aldi, um, she claims that in the 2012 uh, campaign, um, the share of economic topics bumped to 37%, whereas before it was significantly lower. So topics related to, to social inequalities, unemployment, and so on and so forth were much more present uh, uh, in this campaign. Um, later, uh, uh, a few years later, she expressed uh, enthusiasm uh, in front of the successes of Syriza and Podemos, which are arguably left-wing uh, uh, populist uh, uh, parties. She also adopted this language that the elite that threaten uh, uh, the true native French were financial elites. So you can find statesmen such as the financial elites are ready to sacrifice the people on the altar of self-interest uh, and this idea that we need to restore the social services that have been wrecked by three decades of neoliberal ideology. And those elements, again, were not part of the uh, uh, discourse of, uh, of our father. Um, but again, it's important to... Yes, to not uh, 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 fool ourselves uh, with this discourse. Often those uh, measures or discourse that can appear to be uh, left-leaning were a combined accompanied by measures that have the effect of stigmatizing uh, people who benefit from, from social programs. Uh, uh, there was this whole emphasis on being better at detecting fraud in, in social assistance. Uh, you know, uh, um, in the 2014 municipal election, several mayors from the Front National uh, have been uh, uh, elected. And when we look closely at, at their policies, none of them have done any meaningful work to improve the conditions of, of the poor, of the unemployed, and so on and so forth. Uh, quite to the contrary, you can see that several of those mayors have, have raised their salaries and have cut uh, 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 funding for like, local initiatives uh, uh, benefiting uh, 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 um, uh, people uh, uh, in, in, in need. Certain uh, uh, houses providing social services were closed uh, uh, in some of those municipalities and so on and so forth. So again, this seems to be a mere uh, uh, discursive strategy that is not backed by concrete policy proposals when uh, members of the Front National were uh, uh, in power. So I want to discuss two other discursive strategies that were quite uh, uh, um, important and quite strong. Uh, so uh, uh, the first, I've, I found it reading the works of, again, uh, uh, Cécile uh, uh, Aldui, and there's a, uh, a strategy that we can call a, a euphemization. Uh, so basically, 
when Marine Le Pen relied on, on language that was strongly anti-immigrant, uh, uh, there were some meaningful differences with uh, 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 her father. There's a dilution effect, for instance. She measured the relative frequency of, of anti-immigrant speech in Marine Le Pen's discourse. And, and according to her, uh, uh, the frequency at which she made uh, uh, references to, to anti-immigrant sentiment is quite diluted. So it's, uh, uh, um, they are uh, diluted in a larger flow uh, 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 of words. So there's less emphasis placed on it. Uh, and this has the effect that militants of the Front National could sort of react to this and understand that, OK, she is still uh, uh, engaged in the struggle for preserving national identity, cultural purity, and so on and so forth. Uh, because of those cues that were uh, uh, given with much more parsimony uh, uh, than her father, whereas voters uh, more at the center who were undecided uh, uh, would see this as a sign that uh, uh, she was a bit more, uh, uh, well, less virulent than her father, uh, more reasonable, and so on and so forth. She used a language that was also more general and, and abstract uh, in the sense that her father would tell concrete anecdotes, stories that really resonate with, with how people feel, or as she would talk about the numbers of immigrants, so, so like the big picture kind of things, something that is a bit more rational uh, uh, and less uh, uh, deeply rooted in emotion and sentiment compared to her father. <clears throat> uh, and of course, and the third is very important, uh, uh, it's especially, uh, uh, yes. So dilution effect, abstraction, and the third uh, component of this process of, of euphemization is a shift from biological to cultural racism, whereas her father explicitly claimed, as, as I've said uh, earlier, that it's the, the, the genetic pool of friends that is uh, threatened, like the, the biological substance of, of the true, uh, the, the Francais de Souche that is threatened. For Marine Le Pen, there's a greater emphasis on cultural incompatibility between Islam and, and, and French cultural values. So you find a bunch of statements like, French people feel under attack in their habits, the Islamic veil, the requirement on praying sites, the demands for specific food, all of that is in contradiction with her values. So it's not a fear about the genetic replacement, if one, or, or again, the biological uh, uh, purity, but more about cultural compatibility. Good. Uh, so the fourth uh, discursive strategy that I'd like to discuss can be called a process of retortion. Now, <clears throat> retortion is this idea that when you're engaged in a debate with your adversary, one very efficient way uh, uh, to make gains or, or, or progress in this debate is to adapt the language of your opponent to make your point, so to find a common ground and to subvert the terms of this language and to use them to your own uh, advantage. Um, and there are two topics, two examples that are, are quite telling here. There is in Marine Le Pen, it was already present a little bit in, uh, 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 in the discourse of her father, but it seems to be much more present uh, uh, in the current period. So there is a, a language of anti-discrimination and anti-racism that is embraced by, by Marine Le Pen uh, uh, and her followers uh, since 20, uh, uh, <clears throat> 2011. So here again, the idea is to adopt the language of the Republic of Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité uh, to appear as a true legitimate members of, of, of the French uh, political community. So with this idea that, that the Front National can mobilize anti-discrimination and anti-racism, this is how it goes. For anti-racism, uh, Marine Le Pen started to talk about anti-white white racism. So this idea that when you protect the rights of immigrants, what you're actually doing is undermining the status and the privileges of white people. And this is, was depicted by her as a form of, of racism. <clears throat> so um, same thing with, with the discourse of anti-discrimination. She uh, presented herself as the defender 
of white heterosexual males that are now the victims of feminism, toleration of homosexuality, and anti-discrimination uh, uh, measures. So it's important here to see that there is first a language substitution. You use the same terms, but you also subvert the meaning of it. Right? Usually when you talk about racism or discrimination, what you do is to look at the situation of uh, a certain group uh, in society, and you assess their disadvantage by comparing their situation with a baseline of equality. But when Marine Le Pen is talking about uh, anti-white racism or discrimination against a uh, white heterosexual male, what she's doing is to identify a disadvantage that would incur on those privileged group compared to the statu quo, right? Without questioning whether or not the statu quo is something that is fair and legitimate. So, so the way to assess disadvantage, discrimination, inequality gets subverted. So although she uses the same words, the content of those words, the meaning, is, is, is changed with, with something else uh, that we can question. <clears throat> but the effect of this in, in, in public discourse, uh, 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 in conf verbal confrontation, is, is often very important. When you're faced with someone from the far right who talks about anti-white racism, you sort of get uh, 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 into, dragged into the mud, uh, you lose focus on the topic, and you sort of have to explain why there's no racism against the white, and then you get uh, uh, stuck with examples of preferential hiring and so on and so forth. So it's a way to sort of, of, of prevent the topic of discrimination against minorities, racism, and so on and so forth, to really kick off and to change the, the, the focus of the discussion uh, uh, in a way that benefits. Uh, uh, people on the far right. <clears throat> um, the second example of retortion, of using a language that is associated with the left, with progressist, has to do with secularism. It's very important to see that uh, in the time of Jean-Marie uh, Le Pen, he portrayed himself as the defender of the Christian Catholic heritage of France, um, often by depicting it as being threatened by secularist uh, uh, elites who were denying this, this uh, importance, a uh, uh, place of Catholicism. But Marine Le Pen has started to present, it, or to present herself as the defender of secularism, of laicity. And this is a very significant change, uh, again, uh, uh, in the discourse. <clears throat> but while she did so, she portrayed secularism as a core component of national identity. So not as something that is an institutional mechanism to protect the rights of, of, of different uh, uh, groups of people, of religious minorities, of non-believers, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, but as a symbol of the identity of, 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 of French uh, people. She, for instance, uh, suggested the creation of a Ministry of Interior immigration and secularism, so clearly making a link between immigration and the threat to secularism, just in the name of this, this ministry. Um, and she also claimed that Islam was the only religion that poses a threat to secularism in France. <clears throat> so when questioned about uh, 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 to which extent radical Christians who hold anti-abortion views who dem make demonstration against uh, same-sex marriage were a threat to, to secularism. She claimed that actually, no, those Christians are fully compatible uh, uh, with uh, secularism, uh, which is something quite uh, striking. Uh, so just let me read a few. Uh, so how much? Two, two three minutes? Um, so I won't read the, the very long quote at the end, but, but the first quote is perhaps the more telling. Uh, uh, she claimed, for instance, that what I defend is that France uh, uh, is both a secular and a Christian country and shall remain uh, uh, this, uh, as such. Uh, so there's this, this idea that, that there is no incompatibility in claiming that France is both Christian and secular is something that is possible if you depict both elements as core elements of national identity. And if you change the meaning of secularism from 
just something that is symbolical instead of something being a, a legal instrument to protect the rights of, of individuals, for instance. So again, there is this process of, of, of linguistic substitution where you still use the same word by changing uh, uh, its meaning uh, uh, to benefit uh, uh, your own cause uh, uh, in the discussion. Um, as I said at the beginning, this idea that the Front National had became a mainstream political party uh, is not something that is only the result of those kind of discursive strategies. There are also a few contextual or, or external elements that contributed to it. The first can be uh, 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 said to be the uh, uh, ratification of the right. So after 2015, uh, as you recall, there were several attacks in Paris, at Charlie Hebdo, and then at the Bataclan, instead de France. And after those events, um, the topic of the securitization of immigration became something very, very big in France, um, including uh, uh, in the center right. Um, so for instance, in, in lexicometrical analysis, we can see that uh, uh, after those two uh, uh, attacks in Paris, the word security in the, the, the uh, language of, of politicians became uh, uh, as prevalent as words such as equality and liberty in France. So it, it really became at the top of the political agenda for all political parties are most. Uh, parties at the center, center right, started to uh, militate in favor of measures that were proposed by the, the Front National before, such as the déchéance de nationalité, so this idea that, that uh, uh, criminals uh, uh, who uh, uh, are French but have, have an immigrant background could be sent back to their home country if they were found uh, suspected of terrorist uh, activities. Uh, so this was something that the Front National was advocating for, but uh, back then President uh, François Hollande started to talk about it. He even had a, 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 a project of a law for this, he, he dropped it eventually, but, but he defended it for uh, quite some time. Sarkozy had also uh, defended this idea and so on and, and so forth. Uh, there was a strong anti-immigration discourse on the center right, especially uh, in the party uh, Les Républicains. Um, uh, in the 2017 campaign, for instance, uh, uh, François Fillon started to talk about the borders of France being too open in a passoire. Uh, uh, which is the thing that you take to uh, uh, get the water out of your pastas. So too many holes in the borders, it's too easy to immigrate to France. Uh, uh, he advocated for a principle of a strict minimum in, 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 uh, 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 in the, so to reduce the number of, of immigrants that were accepted in France, uh, and so on and so forth. So because of this rightification of the right, uh, many more politicians started to adopt a language that started to resemble to what the FN was saying. This contributed to the blurring effect uh, uh, and to legitimize this view that the Front National was just like the others. So basically, it's not only because the Front National tried to move to the center, but the center moved towards uh, the Front National. <clears throat> uh, just a last slide very quickly. Another element that, that uh, uh, help uh, solidifying this myth of, of, of the deep demonization uh, of the Front National is the dissemination of, of populism. So uh, I'm just going to comment on this table that was prepared by uh, Luc Roubin uh, uh, from Sciences Po at the CVPOF. Basically, he claimed that the winner of this last presidential election was populism itself. And so he and his team at the CVPOF built an index of populism asking questions such as, do you believe that the institutions of, of parliamentary democracy can express the interests of the people? Uh, uh, would you like a, a politician that, that can be closer to you? Uh, do you trust the elites and so on and so forth? And to attribute a score to different parties and, and, and party leaders. And what appeared then is that there are only two political parties for which the, the uh, 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 index, uh, uh, the number of supporters who had a weak populism index was higher than the number of people who had a strong uh, uh, populism index, where uh, the party of Emmanuel Macron and Nicolas Fillon 
for all the other political parties, there were more supporters uh, or militants in those parties that uh, uh, displayed the high populism score, both on the left, uh, with Jean-Luc Mélenchon, but not only, uh, and on the right uh, uh, also. So you sort of have a U-shaped distribution uh, uh, of the vote and a greater number of political parties who adopt the style of populism. And this, as the rectification of the right, is something that contributed to the uh, uh, sort of a blurry effect uh, 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 to uh, 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 make it so that other parties had the style of discourse based on protecting the people against the elite uh, that started to look like uh, the Front National. <clears throat> but as I said, I believe that this idea of the de-demonization of the Front National is more of a myth than a reality. But uh, uh, if you look at the discursive strategy and contextualist elements around it, this idea that, that the Front National became much more mainstream is something that can be uh, uh, explained by uh, so the four discursive strategies I mentioned and those two uh, uh, contextual elements. So thank you. Thank you very much for this great presentation, Francois. And uh, I suggest we go on with this topic. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, my colleague uh, Eva Senashi to go on with it and to present her paper. Because uh, Francois Boucher's presentation focused on migration and uh, politism uh, and uh, populism. In my paper, I, I analyze uh, the question for more general perspective, relying uh, on the, uh, the uh, other aspect of the of the question. Uh, yes. More and more often, uh, the first decades of the 21st century are are described by social scientists as the age of the populisms. For example, Kasmude is writing about uh, a populist spirit of the age, or Pierre Rosanvallon titled his latest book, The Century of Populism. Originally, populism was uh, usually defined as popular revolt, but in the past decades, the main features of populism has become stabilized, uh, and its so-called fragmented ideology has become describable theory. The migrant crisis, crisis that began in 2010 and culminated in 2015 triggered the strengthening uh, uh, of populist party in several European countries, and it also resulting in an anti-migration discourse appearing in, uh, uh, in populist, uh, populist form. The paper investigates Marine Le Pen's major speeches in 2015 and 2016 when the migration crisis was at its uh, climax and when the tragic terrorist attacks happened in France in order to survey the changes the migration crisis uh, triggered in the communicational uh, strategy of, uh, uh, of Nas National Front. Then, in the wider context, the paper shows the basic principle of the party, its notion of democracy, and its projected vision of future. Uh, the National Front was created in, yes, its uh, current, uh, current logo of the party. Uh, the party, the new party, uh, the new party name was created by the combination of uh, Rassemblement Bleu Marine, uh, the assembly around Marie Le Pen at the time of uh, 2012, uh, and uh, the, the Front National, uh, the name resemblance, uh, uh, historic name resemblance, so, yes, interesting to, 
Donc, le Front National, was, uh, the National Front, was created in 1972 from several four rights groups and movements. Uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen was elected of the leader of the party, uh, possibly as an irony of the fate, he started his political career in the movement of Pierre Poujad, who was considered to be one of the forerunners of populism. The Republican Alliance uh, managed to isolate the uh, openly racist, anti-Semitic and nas nationalist party for a long time. The party's earlier leader announced here his retirement in 2010 and passed the party leadership won his, uh, his younger daughter, Marine Le Pen. She started out to build a new party, seemingly leaving extremely light thing, thing, uh, notions behind. It must be noted uh, here that uh, the leader of the Front National was often accused of ne nepotism and building on clientele since the, the important decisions, decision making position of the party were distributed among his family members, wife, wife daughter, son-in-law, and uh, close friends. One of the uh, ex-employees of the front humorously noted regarding this practice, this practice uh, uh, unusual within democratic system that it would be more pre precise to call the party Front Familial instead Front National. The political change represented by Marine Le Pen has been interpreted uh, uh, no. uh, the election of Marine Le Pen uh, brought serious changes with, within the party from, uh, from different perspectives. Uh, the new president uh, made it clear in her inauguration speech that her strategic goal was to transform the, par uh, the party into uh, a quote, renewing an open, effective organiz organization and to get the power, unquote. Anti-Semitic and racist statement, uh, statement uh, disappear from the communication and the more markedly populist language appears, appears in the speeches of, uh, of the new leader. This process uh, was described uh, in French journalism par des diabolisations. Uh, the victim of which was her father himself, uh, who was expelled from the party by his own daughter. The political change represented by, by Marine Le Pen has been interpreted in diverse says, ways. Some see it uh, as a radical turn, others think uh, uh, of it, uh, of continuous with the party traditional policy, policies. Uh, Cécile Alduy argues for continuity because she thinks that the nas National Front and its new leader follow, follow the ideas of the old party and preserve the values that Jean-Marie Le Pen always professed, quote, the nation, the home country, order, safety, work, family, France, the future of the, France, of the French, and Joan of Arc. According to Adoui, the liberal and uh, republican rhetoric remain disguise, uh, remain a disguise that only serve to make uh, to National Front, front uh, presentable. As opposed to Aldoui, Dominique Renier argues that the change, well, was real. Renier links the change to the, to the appearance of a new kind of populism, neo-populism, that he describes 
not so much a French, but rather is a general European tendency. He claims that this neo-populism he calls patrimonial was born in the Nether Netherlands with Pim Fortuyn's movement in, two, uh, in 2002. Uh, the movements uh, criticized the Islam uh, on the basis of values uh, like uh, uh, tolerance, human rights, the freedom of speech. In France, Marine Le Pen is using the same strategy. Also, the father, Ford, Ford, founder of the party included opponent uh, in the Republic and the, uh, of the Republic and uh, the Revolution, following Marine's turn. Uh, presents, represents itself uh, as the main defender of the revolutionary spirit and the republican ideas. Marine Le Pen reinterprets the values of the French Revolution and the Republic by showing them from a new perspective. For her, freedom does not appear as a person person's individual freedom, but attains a collective quality. Collective freedom is uh, embedded in the freedom of the nation and the country, and it's uh, strongly connected uh, to safety. She attacks Islam, especially radical Islam, acting uh, Acting as the defender of the democratic rights and laicity, she criticizes the Islam because of its lack of freedom rights, gender equities, equalities, and because of the subordinated position of the woman. The wave of migration in 2015 was triggered by the civil war in Iraq and Syria and the fall uh, of the Gaddafi regime in Libya. In the speeches of Marine Le Pen, migration appear as in uh, Indian river that threatens the existence of Europe. She does not distinguish economic refugees from political ones. Uh, she treats all migrant, migrants is, as economic migrants and shows little empathy for them. In the same year, at the clim climax of the migrant crisis, ISIS orchestrated terrorist attacks against France performed by French Islamic terrorists. Marine Le Pen interpreted the attacks as uh, a source against French cult cultural and uh, historical heritage, national ident identity, and republican values. After the attack, the, uh, the, the anti-migration tone of the party communication uh, strengthened even uh, further. She transformed her father's triadic slogan, uh, uh, immigration, insecurity and employment to uh, immigration, communitarianism, and Islam fundamentalism. After the terror attack in Paris, she added the term terrorism to. Marine Le Pen defines Islam fundament fundamentalism as a totalitarian ideology and terrorism is a weapon uh, in the service of Islam fundamentalism. She posits a direct rel relationship between uh, immigration and the spread of, uh, of uh, radical Islam. Therefore, the question of, many, uh, of immigration means two differ different things for the party in uh, an external fight the defense of the border against uh, refugees, and uh, in internal fight against Islam. In the context of this conflict, 
she feels increasing need to defend the nation and its values. According to her, the national community is the only existing entity that, quote, has been deeply in, uh, ingrained in every person's mind, unquote. Her national community is sustained by the real, religious, uh, uh, religious uh, by, by the glorious nation, national past, republican values, and national sim symbols. Uh, and yet, she, she thinks of the nation not as a political community of citizens with acquire rights, uh, rather a community of faith with ethnic, your, uh, with ethnic origin that she often identifies with the, with the people. Uh, uh, and iconic figure, figure of the concept of the nation is uh, Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc appeared in Marine Le Pen's speeches as the uh, embodiment of Christianity, patriotism, and heroism. She embodies uh, all the values, all the values professed by the National Front and its leader. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and its leader, Marine Le Pen, draws a historical parallel between the time of Joan of Arc and contemporary France. She implies that contemporary France needs exactly the, the, that kind of heroism and self-sacrifice in, uh, in the fight against uh, uh, migration and the Islam fundamentalism that Jeanne d'Arc took upon herself against foreign uh, intruders uh, in her age. Uh, in the actual fight, uh, the National Front is de depicted is the, big, is, the, uh, is the highest symbol of resistance and national unity, uh, the only possible force that can realize the mythical community she, she imagined, imagines the, uh, to be recreated. National Front de Resistance, Resistance. Uh, however, the concept of donation uh, as a community of faith uh, with uh, ethnic uh, preference, with ethnic origins, is much more exclusive than inclusive. Marine Le Pen's uh, definition of the, national, nation, of the nation only include assimilated immigrants. Uh, she rejects a multicultural society and she questions the possibility, the possibility of different ethnic, relig ethnic and religious community living together peacefully. Uh, she declares uh, that multiculturalism, multiculturalism is dangerous for French identity because multicultural society acquires multi-conflicted uh, society. She argues for uh, republican assimilation, uh, which, uh, quote, strengthens and melts together the national community because it's a firm in uh, stu uh, stipulating, uh, stipulating the condition of admitting those men and, those and women who would like uh, to live on our, our land. Frenchness is either inherited or has to be deserved." Uh, unquote. In this case, one has to meet several conditions to become a French citizen. One, uh, quote, has to speak French, has to eat the French way, live the French way, to respect uh, Fran France's laws, adopt her, her history, integrate her values, unquote. Uh, 
she requires the assimilation of uh, immigrant, immigrant uh, as a defender of laicity. She she's disregards the danger that such a rigid understanding of republic, republican values uh, can, stre uh, can strange as, uh, strength, strength as uh, uh, segregation and Muslim communitarianism. In contrast, a more liberal understanding of republican values would, for, for example, allow for using non-provocative religious uh, symbol, uh, symbols in school and would relate more openly uh, to different uh, eating habits based on religious convictions. Convic convictions. Uh, Marine Le Pen applies laicity as the do as a double uh, aged sword. On the, uh, on the one hand, she defends the rights of Muslim women on the basis of laicity. Uh, on the other hand, she argues against the culture and religion of Muslim community, asserting their in interest. And uh, in this case, she used laicity in a restrictive, restrictive sense. The leader of the party thinks of politics as a, size, as, a, as a site where opposition and conflict has, has to be polarized. This is uh, in contra contrast with a liberal, 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 liberal idea of politics as a site where uh, uh, consensus provides to basis of, uh, uh, the basis of uh, decision-making. In her speeches, he rely on a rhetoric that border war rhetoric. On the level of economics, the war waged against uh, globalization, globalization and ultra-liberal economy on the level of politics, the war waged against the political elite, and on the level of uh, ideology against uh, Islam, especially fundamentalism. In the light of, uh, of the above, one can argue that Marine Le Pen is, uh, is projecting the vision of bipolar, uh, bipolar society. According to his, the corrupt political elite and governments serve the needs of the uh, EU and are opposed to the forgotten France. Forgotten France, la France des oubliés, is made uh, up uh, of down and, uh, and out groups living in the peripheries of metropolises and uh, attracts, attraction zone of uh, big agglomerations. Uh, called uh, usually loser, uh, per, uh, loser of the modernization, often the, often the, these people come from groups that are uh, either threatened with uh, a, an employment or have long been unable to find a, a fur, a find work. In soci sociological studies, this diffuse mass created uh, one hand by globalization uh, and the other hand, uh, the breaking up of uh, classical class, uh, class structures is close uh, precariat. This uh, loser of the modernization and this precariat constitute one of the electoral bases of the party. In contrast, the populist notion, uh, populist notion of the uh, homogenized uh, people is used by Marine Le Pen in a political sense. Yes, it was the John Art commemoration. Uh, and uh, yes. Uh, Marine Le Pen celebrated holiday of Joan of Arc with a fork and patriotic banquet. 
and uh, I would like uh, uh, my hmm? from Estonia. A slogan. This is the slogan of the Vichy regime he, who adopted by Viktor Orban as the motto of his speech in, in 2018, Munka Chalad Haza, Savio Dirk Work, Family and, and Patri. Yes, the fetal voice. Uh, on the level of politics and uh, theory, the opposition above is, uh, above is manifested uh, in the conflict between patriot and globalist and the results in, very, uh, in uh, various images of the enemy. The patriot defend the interest of the nation, a wise globalist serve foreign uh, interest, the National Front projects this image of the enemy, the political party in opposition as well. Opposition party that stand widely apart from each other uh, on political spectrum uh, can thus to lend together and condemn. Uh, through this process of creating an enemy, he find the, we find to, to bird of expression like UMBS from the mixing of central right uh, party UMP uh, and the socialist party PS, uh, indicating those who quote work for the destruction of France hand in hand unquote. In con in contrast. Uh, as one single alternative group transgressing the multi-party system of pluralist democracy, the National Front uh, characterizes itself as a party that represents all national interests, uh, that the slogan Nidroat Nigosh uh, prove neither, neither right nor left, National Front. In reality, however, it uh, anticipates the possibility of a uh, unified party and maybe a one-party system within the framework uh, of the democratic, uh, democratic political system. This would be uh, Quote, real, re, this would be the real uh, rearrangement of French political life, unquote. As the part of the renew, renew, renewal, Marine Le Pen urges for a referendum by popular initiative, initiative that she sees as the expression of national, national will and the possibility for modernizing democracy. Bringing uh, up the Italian example, she support uh, a referendum in the case 500,000 signature for it, although it's not clear whether she would support the decision making or consultational. Uh, kind of uh, uh, referendum. In general, uh, in general, uh, Marine Le Pen draws a dramatic picture about the moral crisis of the French nation, the decline of the country, and its Islamiz Islamization. She sees one solution: the strong state. <coughs> the strong state, because it's only the state that serves. The national community defense and efficient can ensure, ensure laicity, republican principle, and fundamental freedoms. The strategic state, as she call it, is uh, both defending uh, and innovative. It guarantees safety and it uh, res resists religious fundamentalism. 
It works like a think tank. It has a central role in managing the, the economy and supporting investment. Besides the important, important economic role, she highlights uh, the social function of the states too. However, uh, social uh, benefit and the creation of workplace is uh, uh, imaged uh, by Marine Le Pen of the expulsion of foreign, as, uh, uh, primarily non-European workplace. Uh, Marine Le Pen is uh, relying uh, on uh, populism is a cons consistent co uh, communica communicative strategy. Her elastic ideology adapts the changes of everyday political situation. It adopts classic, uh, classic topics, and at the same time, the same time it uh, returns several ideological elements of the old, old front. In other words, along with the formal and linguistic renew renewal, there is still a strong conception, uh, conceptual link to the lime Jean-Marie Le Pen used to take. In this basis of this, I would place the party in the category I call conservative populism, because the party's policy endorses both elements of the conservative slogan, change why continue. However, the party's vision of the future project the image of a monolithic political system and uh, an intolerant, uh, intolerant closed society. It openly embraces anti-establishment, anti-system stance, its opposition to existing, uh, existing political system. Its denial of multicultural society, society, its vision of uh, an omnipotent state and its exclusive idea of the nation may even subject uh, an authoritarian regime. In the near future, most probably, the further success of the Front National will be uh, determined by the possible negative, is, negative changes of the French or European economic, economic and political environment, the declining social uh, circumstances, uh, the ongoing migration crisis, and the tension deriving for the coexistence of the different, different, differing culture, cultures. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Eva, for this uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, as you see, coffee and refreshments are coming in. But before we take our coffees, uh, I would like to ask uh, my friend um, Janusz Salomon to wake us up, to refresh us a little bit uh, by taking a theoretical approach. Well, I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me, and I want to compliment uh, them for their courage to, uh, to invite philosophy, this useful subject, to, uh, to, uh, to a realm of uh, uh, social, social sciences which are demonstrably useful. And uh, by, way of, uh, by way of expressing my gratitude, uh, I want to, uh, to make sure that I, I'm, I'm going to be useful and I'm not going to misbehave from start to finish. Uh, I want to start with useful information. I am not sure how many of you are, are aware of the fact that uh, next month we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the first Earth Day. This is going to be April 22nd. And, uh, <clears throat> and I... I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting question, why exactly 1970 was the first celebration of Earth Day? And the answer is that it has to do, actually, with uh, moon travel, because uh, the previous summer, in, in the summer of 1969, uh, there was a, 
a breakthrough in space science. Uh, we, uh, the, the Americans actually managed to land a spacecraft on the moon. And this was the first time when we, as humanity, could take a good look at the Earth itself from the moon. And this was so touching, the site itself was so touching, uh, you might say that it brought tears to humanity's eyes, uh, that uh, uh, the next year, in the spring of 1970, they decided to, uh, to institute this day and vowed to, to celebrate it every year from then, then on. And at the end of the same year, at the, in December of 1970, uh, the United States Environmental Protection Agency was called into uh, existence. So that was another breakthrough. Uh, so the, uh, what I want to say uh, is that there's a close connection between uh, astrophysics and space travel and philosophy. And the connection is simply that. Uh, philosophy also likes to take the long view and likes to look back uh, from the moon at the Earth. And this is what I'm going to try to do in this lecture. Uh, so the, the uh, uh, and I'm, I'm going to try to break a Guinness record in, in <coughs> making this trip, this moon trip, uh, in 25 minutes. Uh, so the question, the coming back to Earth, the, uh, the simplest, the, the most down-to-earth question that one could raise in connection with my subject, populism, is, well, is it, what is it? Is it a movement or is it, is it an ideology? But an even simpler question is, uh, well, we can, we can start from, from the word itself. We know that it comes from the Latin populus, meaning people. So, so if we don't know anything about this subject, we know that it, has to do with the people. And the next logical question is, well, is it something that people do, or is this something that it is, is done to the people? And my suggestion is that if it is something that the people do, then it's a movement. And if it's something that it is done to the people, then it's an ideology. And I use ideology in, in its uh, Marxist uh, sense as a functional concept. Uh, the function of ideology is to help whoever uses this ideology to gain, solidify, and maintain power. Uh, so this is the sense that I'm using ideology. Uh, so this is the question whether uh, populism is something that the people do or whether it's something that is done to the people, whether it's an ideology or a movement. Uh, so, now as it turns out, uh, popul populism uh, is actually an aristocratic idea. Uh, it's a matter of history that uh, it is populism itself is as old as democracy. Uh, we can say that it, it that uh, Cleisthenes is the first populist. He's the one who is famous for his uh, so-called democratic reforms. This, we are at the end of the sixth century, uh, and uh, it's not really important from our point of view to go into the details. There were actually very interesting reforms, and one, one might say that the essence of this, these reforms was uh, that he implemented a positive gerrymandering by completely reorganizing the population in Athens and in the surrounding region called Attica, uh, so that the, the purpose of this reorganization was to, to let uh, poor people into political power as well. From the last corner of this region, everybody uh, got to have a say in forming uh, the laws. This is why the system itself is referred to as isonomia, which just means uh, equal law, which means people were not only equal before the law, but they had an equal opportunity to create the law. So this is why we refer to this uh, period in Athenian history as the birth of democracy at the end of the 
sixth century. Uh, <clears throat> now, what I, what I think is, is important to realize that democracy itself is a byproduct, which appears to be a byproduct of, uh, of uh, the infighting, the political infighting which took place uh, for a long time, not just at, at, the, at the end of the sixth century, but for a long time in Athenian history between rival uh, aristocratic families, in our case, between the uh, Acmeonites and the Pisistratids, and Cleisthenes himself was an Acmeonide, and uh, the way it used to work up to the end of the sixth century in Athens was that the Spartans appeared when the fight, the, the, the uh, political rivalry was, uh, or came to a standstill, then the Spartans came in and uh, helped one or the other family into power. Uh, but, but at this point of time, at the end of the sixth century, the Spartans were either too tired of this game or were otherwise occupied. But uh, from our point of view, it's, it's not uh, crucial. But uh, it, it, this had to be decided between these two families. And uh, this, and Cleisthenes was the first one who came up with the idea, well, let's turn to the poor people. Now, you, we have to realize that uh, the classical Aristotelian definition of poor means poor people are, are those who have to work for a living. So by that definition, we are all poor here. Uh, but, but anyway, it, it, uh, in, in that uh, point of history, it was a great discovery because these people, uh, those who had to work for a living, were simply completely excluded from the political game. And by introducing to them, introducing them to this field, uh, whoever did this uh, obviously uh, gained great support in the political infighting of 6th century BC Athens. Um, so solidarity is a key concept in populism. Uh, the idea being that uh, the, the uh, populist leader, whether it's uh, Cleisthenes or anybody else, uh, I should mention, although it belongs to the slide previous, that, uh, that interestingly enough, uh, as luck would have it, or as history would have it, uh, almost the same year, we are talking about also at the end of the sixth century, uh, 509 BC to be precise, uh, this was the year when the Romans got rid of their king, Tarquinius, and this is, uh, from this moment, we, we start talking about the Roman Republic. Uh, and needless to say, uh, this was also not the result of, the, of a popular uprising, but uh, the start of the Roman Republic and the getting rid of the king was also uh, a byproduct of uh, the infighting of the king, the, 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 the court, uh, the royal court and uh, rival uh, aristocratic families. So uh, the, uh, the idea of, uh, of self-government uh, is not limited to, to Athens or Greece, and the idea of populism is not limited. Uh, I also mentioned uh, as the first Roman populist or the most famous Roman populist the Gracchi brothers, uh, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, uh, and also uh, Publius Clodius, and uh, <clears throat> they really went at great length to, to show their solidarity with the people. They also uh, implemented or tried to push through uh, reforms through the Senate, which were very favorable uh, to the people, but of course, uh, directly or indirectly were also very favorable to their uh, political efforts. So uh, just uh, to, to show you how seriously uh, populist leaders take their solidarity 
with the people. We have this figure, Juan Perón, who came into power in 19, at, the, at the end of the Second War and uh, was, was known to deliver his speeches with his sleeves rolled up uh, to show his solidarity with the descamisados, which means the shirtless ones. Uh, an interesting parallel between him and uh, Philippe Egalité, who, sh to show his, his uh, solidarity with the people, changed his name from the Duke of Orléans to Philippe Egalité, and also showed great uh, sympathy and solidarity with the saint Uh So without uh, silk breeches or without shirts, it doesn't matter. Uh, the point is that you belong to the people, uh, or you are sympathetic to those people who can't afford uh, to, to have shirts or silk breeches. Uh, the uh, up-to-date version of rolled up sleeves, as I point out in this slide, is Twitter. Uh, this is what uh, the president that we all love to hate uh, is most famous for. Uh, uh, he, uh, and I call this Twitter grunts, because these are really just uh, very uh, impulsive expressions of, uh, well, I wouldn't call them ideas, uh, uh, well, sort of uh, explosions unencumbered by the thought process, as they usually say. Now, the, the, uh, the reason why it's so easy for these populist leaders to, to identify with the people is that there is no logical contradiction between, uh, or there is no logical connection between uh, intelligence or uh, intellectual and elite. Uh, you can be an elite and not uh, be very intelligent. So there is, in other words, there is no uh, contradiction uh, uh, between uh, when we say that uh, we have an unintelligent elite. We have plenty of examples of this in history. I consider, by the way, I consider uh, populist dictators to belong to this group. Uh, I know that uh, even uh, good-meaning liberals uh, sometimes express their admiration uh, uh, although qualified admiration for populist leaders for their capacity to to sway uh, internal or external politics and to to uh, to sweep up in one uh, emotional fervor their people, uh, uh, the prime minister of this country is admired by by many opposition intellectuals. I'm not one of them, uh, even though I consider myself uh, an opposition. Uh, to this government, but I'm not uh, a great admirer of the intelligence of this prime minister. I think uh, this type, uh, the, the uh, uh, populist dictator type, is usually cunning and shrewd, but not intelligent, uh, at least not in the classical sense. In the classical sense, you cannot be intelligent if you don't live the best possible human life. I really doubt that uh, the president that we, uh, of the White House or this, this uh, prime minister is leading the best possible life. Uh, uh, according to the classical perception, they are leading the worst possible human life. Uh, there's a lot of good argument to show that. So uh, now, so this is why I say that uh, while the history is filled with shrewd and cunning unintelligent dictators, uh, the history of democracy, on the other hand, is filled with intelligent uh, politicians who use some of their intelligence uh, to, to hide their intelligence because uh, they, they simply uh, understand the advantage of appearing as uh, one of the people. Now, I call this uh, a mutual admiration society, and the, uh, the abbreviation, if you put together, there is actually mass, uh, 
but, uh, but I think it, this picture expresses pretty much the, the relationship between the populist leader and the masses. Now, of course, uh, I'm aware of, uh, of the debate that goes on uh, between political scientists and perhaps even political philosophers, uh, which, which, uh, which is uh, concerned, which, which uh, the subject of the debate is whether the masses are indeed irrational and they can be therefore uh, manipulated by uh, these shrewd and cunning politicians, or there is some rationality, actually a lot of rational consideration on the part of the people, the masses, because there are certain uh, conditions uh, which they cannot improve, their, their life conditions cannot be improved uh, unless they make a, a, a tacit agreement, uh, a pact with a leader who breaks through all the red tape which separates them from their objects of desire. Uh, Huey Long is a good example of that. Huey Long was the uh, governor of Louisiana in the 1930s, and he indeed uh, justified the trust that the people put in him by uh, building roads and bridges. Uh, Louisiana was a very poor, probably the most uh, neglected and the poorest state in the United States in the 1930s. And so Huey he, he Long was the one who built these roads and bridges and, and gave uh, uh, free school books to children. Uh, these were very popular measures and it made him immensely popular among the poor, uh, which were not only those who, who didn't, uh, who, who made a, uh, who had to work for a living, but those who had, who didn't have a work at all. Uh, so, and you might say that this was very rational on the part of the people of Louisiana to support Huey Long, who in the end became a downright fascist, but, uh, but nonetheless, he did a lot uh, in, by way of improving the, the life living conditions of his con constituency. Uh, now, I'm not, not uh, I'm not convinced by this argument. I'm a little more convinced by the, uh, I think uh, history uh, has to be taken into consideration. The long view of history tells us that uh, the masses uh, do exhibit irrational behavior and that Marx was wrong when he assumed uh, that uh, the proletarian movement is a self-conscious movement an independent movement of an immense majority uh, in the interest of an immense majority. <laughs> the argument was, and it was a very hopeful argument, that history up to the 19th century was nothing but a story, a very sad story of minorities uh, exploiting and oppressing and terrorizing majorities. And this is going to be the first time in history where a majority will do the same to a minority, the bourgeoisie, uh, and will somehow get rid of this minority, and this is how we are going to end up in a classless society and paradise on earth. Uh, so history proved Marx wrong, and, uh, and it seems that this was just another case where uh, the majority could not come to self-consciousness. The proletariat just didn't come to self-consciousness. And this is why uh, remedies had to be found among Marxists. And Lukács, uh, which is famous remedy, is one of these, uh, these uh, suggestions. Uh, he was talking about the empirical consciousness of the proletariat and the imputed or zugerechnete consciousness of the proletariat. And by imputed consciousness, means he, he meant uh, what the proletariat would think if they were in the position to discover their objective situation. But this would never came into will, uh, into reality, 
So uh, the bridge had to be, or the, the, uh, the chasm had to be closed by the party who was supposed to embody the will, the general will of the proletariat. Uh, so this is, I think, one good reason why we shouldn't be uh, terribly convinced by the argument that the masses are capable of rational behavior. Uh, so the, the uh, if we are talking about the movement, uh, we, we, we have to say that uh, populism as a movement is definitely anti-elite, but not necessarily anti-intellectual. I mean, definitely anti-intellectualist, but not necessarily anti-elite, uh, which is just another way of saying that uh, a populist movement or, or the masses are, are always receptive to authority, uh, but never really receptive to an intellectual elite or an intellectual authority. Uh, and the, the simple explanation of this would be that uh, while they are not objecting to, to, the, to a rule of an elite, uh, they want an elite which speaks their language. And since they are not uh, an intellectual mass, uh, therefore they do not. I, I remember in the 1980s, uh, Mario Como was the governor of New York, and uh, people were whispering about his chances to become, or a lot of people were urging him to run for, president, for the presidency. And, uh, and he himself was intelligent enough to understand that he, he just doesn't have a chance uh, because he, uh, he just could, didn't speak the language of the people. He, he spoke in eloquent English, uh, in round, complete sentences. You could put, put those uh, speeches into a book immediately. Uh, so this was just too much. And, and people understood that, therefore, he doesn't have a chance. Uh, now, on the other hand, uh, populism as an ideology builds both on anti-intellectualism and anti-elitism, which is funny because, uh, after all, we are talking about the elite. But of course, we understand the dynamics of this uh, when we look at historical cases. Claudius went as far, we are talking about the uh, second century uh, BC Rome, Claudius, the populist, uh, who, by the way, came for a, from a patrician family, went as far as, uh, as uh, arranging for an adoption by a, a plebeian, plebeian family uh, because that was the condition of he becoming a, a tribune uh, of the people. Uh, the, the funny part was that the person who adopted him was about 20 years younger than he, which, which made it ridiculous, uh, besides being illegal. The only reason he could do this because his friend, uh, the leader of the populares, or populares, uh, by the name of Caesar, Julius Caesar, uh, intervened. So he could, he could actually uh, uh, put this through the Senate. Uh, so this is just one way of showing how eager these uh, elite politicians are to, to show their solidarity with the people. I also mentioned another example, Daniel Tompkins, who, uh, who was a Columbia graduate, which made him one of the most uh, educated intellectual in uh, 18th century America, or early 19th century America. Uh, he was running for the governorship and he was running against an aristocrat, uh, a Livingstone aristocrat. There were two great aristocrats. So he felt it uh, important to, to uh, because it's not easy to be an intellectual actor. It's not easy to, uh, the, the word itself, uh, intelligence, uh, criticism, and discerning all mean, all go back to the same Latin root. And it basically just means 
to tell a part. The, to, to be intelligent is to have the ability to tell things apart, important things like good and bad, right and wrong, beautiful and ugly. Uh, so if you don't have this ability, uh, you cannot uh, function as an intellectual. As an intellectual, uh, the the Greek word krino means exactly uh, to separate, and this is where we get uh, criticism or to criticize. Uh, so, in politics, uh, one of the most important distinctions that you you have to be able to make is the difference between the good and the pleasant. Uh, and as a populist politician, you rely on your, on your knowledge that the masses that you preach to are unable to make this distinction. So therefore, you feel free to whisper pleasant things into their ears, to tell them pleasant things, uh, knowing that they are, these things are not actually good for anyone, not good for the people, but that they sound pleasant. And before, be, because the people cannot tell the difference between the pleasant and the good, therefore, you can hoodwink them and sell your political uh, product to them. OK, now this is liftoff. We are off to the moon because we are going to talk about theology. Uh, my argument is that, uh, of course, in ancient times, uh, populism, uh, I mean, anti-intellectualism existed in ancient times, but it wasn't foundational. When we talk about ancient anti-intellectualism, we, we obviously talking about the Sophists. Uh, the Sophists were the first professional teachers, and they, they were the first one who accepted money for their teaching. And among their, their, their wares that they were selling on the, on the uh, intellectual market was uh, the, the most important uh, uh, good that they were selling was rhetoric. And the, the aim of rhetoric is not uh, to convince anyone. This is another important distinction between to convince and to persuade. Uh, Again, two Latin words. Uh, convince means, uh, goes back to conquer, convincere, and persuade goes back to, so when you could want to convince somebody, uh, this is why in English, by the way, uh, convince can be used with an infinity, but persuade cannot. Uh, or at least this is the, what uh, purist will tell you, uh, purist of in English language. So when you convince somebody, you actually want to conquer that person by argument. Uh, so this is a rational victory that you, you are aiming at when you convince somebody. But when you persuade somebody, you just want him or her to come over to your side by any means. This is what the word itself tells us. Because per suade, suade just means sweet in Latin. So when you persuade somebody, you you drip sweet little things into his or her ears, and you want to sweet talk this person to come over to your side. It has nothing to do with rationality or reason. So, uh, so yes, anti-intellectualism existed in ancient times, but it wasn't foundational. Uh, it became foundational with basically with Saint Augustine and. Uh, with his theological argument. Uh, the, 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 this theological argument centered around or gave rise to a debate in, uh, in the high Middle Ages between the intellectualists and the voluntarists. And I, I give you a list of uh, people who are on the two sides. I could have put uh, St. Augustine as the inspirer of, of uh, the voluntaries that I listed. But, uh, but I will uh, briefly touch on his argument anyway as we, as we move quickly along. Uh, so the, 
the argument is very simply put this. Uh, God could have created in his infinite freedom a completely different world. He, we, we, once again, we make an important distinction here between potentia ordinata and potentia uh, absoluta. Potentia absoluta refers to the power of God uh, which makes him able to create anything he wants, and potentia ordinata refers to his power, which he used to create this particular contingent thing we call uh, called world. Uh, uh, but he could have created a world where two plus two makes fifteen, and uh, uh, adultery uh, receives uh, the highest uh, national uh, honor or award. In, in any country, uh, or even murder, or whatever serial killers are celebrated as national heroes, he could have created a completely different moral or intellectual world, but he chose to create this one. The idea is that uh, this is the essence of voluntarism, you might say. Uh, God did not create this world because this is a good world or the best world. This is the best world because God created it. This, this, is, the, this is one way to, to, to summarize the, uh, uh, the essence of voluntarism. And from our point of view, it's only interesting because we inherited this. We have, uh, we have our roots going down to this theological decision by, uh, by St. Augustine in the fifth century. And and the, the triumph of the voluntarists uh, lives on in what we know as modern liberalism. Uh, now, the, uh, one, one other way of, of putting uh, the voluntarist view is that, that uh, reality itself is simply close to human uh, intellect. So therefore, we have to find a different function for our, for, for our, for our reason. Uh, and this is uh, what happened uh, in the, since the early 16th centuries on. Uh, we, we turned our intellect into a servant of our will and the will of human beings is to create an earthly paradise. I, the, Francis Bacon is, is, a, is an important figure here who was talking about uh, the book of God and the book of nature. And we cannot read the book of God, but we can read the book of nature. And we can read the book of nature with profit. Uh, we can uh, discover truth in this realm, which is accessible to human intellect. And, uh, make ourselves home in this. If we can never know reality as it is, we can never fulfill the classical or, or the aspiration of philosophy in its classical sense, which is to look at, uh, to look for the whole. The, the philosophy is in love with everything, the whole, the cosmos, not not its part, just like when you are in love, you are not in love with a certain aspect of the other person. If that's the case, then it's not love, but association, partnership, uh, uh, some sort of uh, agreement uh, for, to, to the mutual uh, advantage of the parties, but it's not love. If you are in love, you are in love with the person from top to toe, and, uh, and there is no detail which... Uh, which you, with which you get stuck. So, uh, populism identifies the will uh, of the people with the general uh, moral good uh, and with justice. And, uh, and if we translate what I just said about, uh, about uh, God creating this world, not because it's good, but but it is good because God created it. Uh, the same applies to our modern, this is what we inherited uh, from these theological roots. Uh, the public good becomes what the public desires. 
this will be important. Uh, and reason uh, takes a back seat. Uh, we can have, I mean, as, as uh, passengers on an airline, we can all have our opinions about how to run this ship, right, this uh, spaceship. And uh, therefore, uh, theoretically speaking, in a democracy, we are all qualified, right? This is why we have general elections. Uh, the Greeks, by the way, the Athenians, uh, filled most public uh, office spots with, uh, with a lot. So, uh, because they thought this was the most democratic way of deciding uh, uh, how, to, how to fill these spots. Okay, uh, so the, the, uh, the eternal promise of all the populist leaders is that they will bring us paradise on earth. This is, uh, this is by the way, the metaphysical, uh, this is the consolation for our metaphysical deprivation that we, we just cannot have access to reality. Uh, we can have access to our immediate uh, physical environment and therefore we can uh, we use our intellect to make ourselves home at home in this environment. The architects of this paradise are the charismatic leader, uh, the economists, the experts, the specialists, the managers, the bureaucrats, uh, the useful people, right? Uh, but not useless intellectuals like uh, philosophers. This, this. Uh, Alienation of philosophy goes back to Socrates and the Athenian people who felt that Socrates was such an alien among them that they actually executed him, right? So uh, the, uh, this is what Max Weber talks about when he, when he talks about the specialists without a vision or uh, uh, heart and, uh, and bureaucrats. So, uh, who are engineers of the iron cage of, of rational control that we, we all experience these days, uh, where every, every breath that you take uh, is pretty soon going to be monitored by, uh, in this iron cage. So uh, the end result of this uh, voluntarist enterprise is that uh, along with philosophy, and knowledge, truth itself becomes a commodity, uh, uh, and uh, philosophy and knowledge in its original sense uh, is declared completely useless. Uh, as Bacon told us, knowledge is power, and this power now used to control knowledge and truth. Uh, and this is how we, we arrived at, at talking about post-truth era, and this is how uh, that person in the White House uh, has actually more influence over truth than any scientist or any philosopher living today. Uh, so, coming to, to our conclusion, uh, my original title of this lecture was that uh, referred to populism as an uprising against uh, liberalism. Uh, and I want to show you uh, that looking back from the moon, uh, it just doesn't seem to hold water. It just doesn't seem to be true. Uh, the, the, the short view, the, uh, the scientific or political scientific view is deceiving populism, which appears to be an uprising against liberalism is actually when we take the longer view, uh, turns out to be the very essence of liberalism. Uh, for what could be a more popular idea than uh, 
voluntarism, which is the culmination of, uh, of this whole project, that we are the divine creators and self-redeeming creators of the reality that we live in. Uh, if we cannot get to reality, then we feel uh, not only entitled, but obligated to create this reality uh, and to make it as comfortable and healthy and safe as possible. This is exactly what Francis Bacon promised us in the 16th century. Uh, this is the function of science. This is the, the, uh, the reason why philosophy uh, joined science as the handmaiden of uh, this new theology. So, uh, so uh, one thing that we can say at the end is that out of the four uh, defining characteristics of liberalism, uh, self-ownership, anti-paternalism, value individualism, and uh, voluntarism, the last one is really the deepest. It runs deepest uh, in... Uh, defining uh, liberalism. So uh, populism is, uh, is indeed an uprising, but not against, uh, but its target is not uh, liberalism, but human nature. This, this is the conclusion I want to get to when, I, when we start landing back from the moon. Uh, now, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the mistaken assumption built into this voluntarist project is that we can indeed fulfill the Cartesian promise of becoming masters and possessors of, uh, of the earth. Uh, I think there's enough empirical evidence by now that this is a vain hope. Uh, and. Uh, And, uh, and the, the whole idea of transforming nature to our advantage to, as I said, to make uh, this earthly existence as safe and healthy uh, and comfortable as possible uh, actually backfires. And, uh, and the reason it backfires is because Nature, of course, cannot be transformed. The only thing that can be transformed is not nature, but our relation to nature or relationship to nature. Now, that can be transformed, and this is what exactly what we are witnessing. Uh, and and this, the same goes to, to, uh, to our own nature. The uh, nationalist and the socialist versions of populism were very busy in the last century uh, in their attempt to transform human nature. And it turned out that human nature cannot be transformed uh, in the same way as nature herself cannot be transformed. But once again, it is true that our relationship to ourselves can be transformed. Uh, we can make complete fools of ourselves. Yes, that's, that's true, and this is exactly what the socialist man and the fascist man idea was doing to human nature. Uh, so, at the end, my suggestion is that while voluntarism urges us to show solidarity with each other, uh, saying, well, let's, let's make ourselves great again. I'm talking in general terms, but we, we all have these political slogans in our mind. Uh, let's make this or that country great again. Or the socialist version, let's make this or that country great for once and all, finally. Uh, intellectualism, on the other hand, recommends solidarity not with each other, but with the cosmos, with cosmic rationality, or simply with nature, because our greatness uh, depends on our awareness of being part of something which is greater than us. And finally, just one 
more word about liberalism. Uh, after the voluntarist rejection of the cosmos, we are all individuals. We are facing the world, this unknown reality, or the reality that we create ourselves. This is one of the most uh, famous uh, one-liner that you could uh, formulate as a conclusion of Kantian uh, liberalism, that we know only what we create. And, uh, and uh, so the, the, the individual is facing this uh, reality. Uh, the modern subject is now understood as a self-legislating and self-defining spontaneity. This is the essence of Kantian moral philosophy. And in many ways, this is the essence of modern liberalism. Uh, now, this I call the great Kantian self-delusion, uh, that this spontaneity will somehow transform into reason or the rational citizen who will understand that it is his or her own interest in, in his or her own interest to obey the laws that he or herself, uh, himself or herself uh, created. Uh, in this country, I can tell you that people take special pleasure in disobeying the laws that uh, they know they had nothing to do with. In the, in the begin, to begin with. Uh, so uh, I don't think we actually managed to uh, break the Guinness record by doing this trip in 25 minutes, but I hope I gave you at least a little indication of, of, the, uh, of the view of populism taken from, uh, the long view that taken from, uh, is afford, that afforded by a long view of populism. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Janusz, for this very interesting lecture. Now, I would like to keep this question and answer period short. Uh huh. Well, okay, then. Well, maybe it's a bit, bit longer than I planned. Please, yeah. thank you. The microphone is here. I would like to ask my colleague. I would like to ask my colleague to take the microphone, bring it to you. Thank you. Could you please bring the microphone? My friend is doing it. Thank you. I, I'll try to keep it short, but I just wanted to express uh, a frank disagreement with what has just been said. Um, I, on the last presentation, the last speech, it seems to me that uh, there are two things that are very troublesome. The first one is it relies on a blanket statement according to which the people is rational, or history teaches us that the, the people is rational. I would never buy any sort, sort of blanket statement in what context, with what sort of political background, how is the public sphere structured, what sort of education do the people get. I mean, just saying that the people is irrational in general does not seem to me to hold much water. It, it has to be specified and qualified in a way. In some instances, they will prove to be extremely rational. In some in instances, they may act against their own interest, but which doesn't mean that they are ra irrational. And, and so I think it needs to be qualified. It cannot be the premise of the argument. The second thing is, I don't understand how you build your argument, because you start by saying that populism is an ever-present phenomenon, that it existed ever since the antiquity in Athens. And then all of a sudden, it's, it's lumped together with liberalism because they're both, they both inherit the legacy of the Enlightenment. It seems to me that even though they may both inherit from the Enlightenment, they do have very specific features that distinguishes them. For instance, their relationship to pluralism. I mean, one is strongly opposed to any form of pluralism, whereas the other one endorses it and favors and promotes it. And I think this is not anecdotal. It's, it's, it's very important. And so, yes, I'm they... Sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure which of the two one are we talking about. One, populism one. and liberalism. Populism is okay. anti-pluralistic, and okay. it, it's... It, okay. 
favors yeah the, the restriction of the expression of this content, whereas the other one favors yeah freedom of expression and 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 yeah multi parties and and so I here there's something I don't understand. It's why are they why are they similar and if they come from enlightenment, then why is Papoist already a phenomenon in Athens? Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another question from the floor. Uh, first, quickly to Francois, uh, is there any relation between the uh, monetary elite and the right and the populist right wing? Like, uh, do they found anything, and how do they manage this, you know, like conceal this relationship in on the populist right wing? Uh, this would be really quick. First question. I would also address the last presentation because I was really happy to hear some class struggle first, but I was sad that it turned into uh, the simple argument that the mob is irrational and they and they can't behave. Uh, because every time I hear um, people talk about leftists, like Marx, uh, uh, they, they come up with this human nature argument, which, uh, which is funny because um, usually they all address the topic of what human nature is, they all had their concept. Mostly, for example, Marx subtly relies on Spinoza, that we also have um, a really irrational uh, um, side, um, factual part, but we also are intellectual beings. So um, this is why, in some sense, this uh, definition of ideology is not sufficient in this case because uh, that's why they create, for example, how to self criticize the, the or develop the, into a new, new uh, definition of ideolo ideology which uh, in incorporates more in, uh, contextual um, variables what uh, you just mentioned that we also have to address uh, uh, what uh, what people uh, of, are, are capable and aware of. Uh, for example, uh, when you say uh, the populist, mm, populism as a movement is uh, anti-intellectual but not anti-elite, uh, I think this is pretty wrong in the sense that uh, people in this case appear that they don't, simply they just appear that they don't know anything else, but it doesn't mean that there's no any alternative there, there are alternatives. May they may just not appear as uh, um, something that it's right in their hand at the specific moment. Okay, any from challenge the question, Eva? Maybe. I, 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 my question was to you, Juliano. So I have two questions, so that, but they are they go in the similar direction. So I would like to ask. Uh, what is the usefulness of the distinction between uh, between uh, uh, defining populism as an ideology and uh, defining it as a movement? Uh, as I understand, uh, in my understanding, what uh, you have said said that uh, uh, defining populism as an ideology means uh, stigmatization of populism by the elite. And uh, defining populism as a, as a movement means uh, an acknowledgement uh, uh, to appreciate populism as a real demand. But I, I see, for example, in the works of Kaz Mutte that this both presupposition at present at the same time. So in populism research, these are not oppositions. These, uh, these uh, ideas uh, fit together, they are linked. This is, this is my first question, and the second one, you have said that uh, uh, nature is, uh, cannot be transformed. And, my, uh, and at the same time, you have said that uh, fascism and uh, communism uh, transform our relationship to ourselves. So my question is, do you think that human nature is finite, or is it infinite? Okay. Okay, thank you. Alex, please. Get the microphone, please. The microphone. 
you, I was surprised by your argument that the cultural racism was taken over by the Front National in the in the period after 2011. But it's just a question to be better informed because you know when we had the debates on racism and new racism in the 90s, we referred so much to the things. Uh, the an critical analyses by Tagiev and Valibar, and they refer to the writings of Benoit to And so do you say that the Front National then adapt, ad adopt the, the strategy of the new right only in this period of after 2011? Because I expected them to do it already much, very much earlier, yeah? And to make a long discussion very short, I, I have the question to you, Janosch, what, with regard to this last point. I mean, for coming from a long analysis on anti-Semitism, yeah, for Adorno and Horkheimer, it became very clear that one of the strong strate strategic elements of the right is to deny nature that we are more than only constructing society and so on. So this kind of denying. So there is a long criticism of Francis Bacon and also the idea of a constitutive subject that was first elaborated by Kant. And then they came to the result that what is necessary is a new relation to nature and to ourselves as being part of nature. So this, this, this is an important aspect because for us as German left, you know, this is a, one of the main reference points in the analysis against the right. To, yeah? So, and in my eyes, I mean, maybe this was your argument already. Yes, you you equal, equalize or it's like an equivalence between the right and the left. And I wouldn't agree with that argument, but maybe I didn't get it right. Because, you know, there is a long, yeah, because you can say there is a long history in social democracy, in Stalinism, and there are different concepts of how to make use of laws of nature and so on. But, you know, then in critical theory, this is quite a different thing. And also when you think on the French debates, yeah, then you would say like Althusser and Foucault, you would have completely different concepts or, to, or conceptualizations of the laws, you know? So maybe this is going a completely different way. And so also the, the idea that you, or the argument you presented that what is older is stronger. That's in my eyes not obvious. You know, because this was your argument with uh, voluntarism, uh, rooting back in theological debates. Well, well, no, I didn't mean stronger. I'm just talking about the roots that we are very much uh, in territory to be able to differ. Sure, this is yeah, but in a secular form. Yeah, but but what does that mean? I mean, uh, very often it, this argument is used to say, okay, this is in a way because it comes first, it determines. But this is okay, but. This is just only another aspect of yes, that. Yes, you do understand the questions, right? Another question? Thank you. If there is no more question, then I would like to ask my friend to bring the mic to the table, and I, I suggest the following order. Also first, Jan Schlag. Yes. Uh, uh, good. Well, thank you for uh, uh, those uh, uh, two questions. So, so I'll, I'll start with, with the last one. So basically, my claim is, is more than uh, uh, after 2011, with the arrival of Marine Le Pen, um, the, a form of racism based on biological racism disappears. Uh, uh, so there's a distanciation from this. And it was not so much that there was no sort of cultural racism at all before. So, so the shift is by the, the dropping of the biological racism. Uh, uh, but still, it, it strikes me that, that by reading Pierre Vitaillev, for instance, that when he, he, he sort of studies uh, uh, the racism of, 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 of Jean-Marie Le Pen in, in the 80s, for instance, uh, uh, the kind of 
quotes that I've seen. Uh, so when I, I looked at the, 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 the Jean-Marc Lapin period, I, I mostly relied on secondary source as opposed to when I studied the, 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 the period in the time frame, I looked a bit more closely at, at primary sources. But when I see from the work of, of Tayef, for instance, uh, uh, are lots of quotes from, from Le Pen, the father, that do endorse uh, uh, a very strong old-fashioned view uh, uh, of racism. Uh, uh, so this has been abandoned, but I think uh, uh, there were some weak elements of like cultural incompatibility, uh, uh, for instance, but it was less uh, prevalent uh, uh, before. So it's not an absolute distinction, but it's, the distinction is more abandoning the, the, the biological racism than a like, complete uh, substitution from one to the other, uh, if it clarifies uh, good. And for the, the, the first question, uh, so you will be disappointed by my answer. So I know that there are several scandals about the, the, the funding of, of the Front National since uh, the, the 2010s. Uh, uh, some involved uh, a curious loan that was made by uh, a Russian bank uh, 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 like five or six years ago. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure what was the, the end point of this story. If someone else in the room uh, uh, could clarify, I, I'd be happy. But, but so the, there are suspicions that they get money from uh, 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 external or foreign sources uh, uh, that seem to be uh, disturbing. And more recently, uh, after the 2017 election, apparently they were in a difficult financial position and, and received a substantial donation from a very uh, a wealthy French, I think, uh, a businessman sending I don't know, eight or 10 million euros to the, the Front National, uh, someone who had interest in many businesses uh, in Africa, in the Middle East, I think. Uh, uh, it's, I'm, I'm a bit sorry, I'm, I'm uh, uh, less aware of the, the exact details uh, uh, of this. I, I, I'm a, usually a political philosopher doing normative political theory, and for this specific uh, project, I really focused on like the analysis of discursive strategies uh, uh, more than on a, an expensive study of the Front National that would uh, uh, look at all dimensions. But uh, uh, it was a Scandals about the funding of the Front National has been something very important in, in the, the critique. Like the opponents uh, uh, kept mentioning it to raise doubts about uh, uh, this discourse that claimed that we should give priority to, to French, to strong French priorities, and then receiving funding from external sources looked uh, suspicious a bit. So this was definitely an issue uh, uh, in the period that I looked. Uh, uh, but this was not something that was part of the discursive, discussing this was not part of the discursive strategy of Marine Le Pen in her attempt to, to de-demonize the, the party. Okay, so first I want to reassure everyone that I, I am a liberal, uh, although a, a, a very, perhaps uh, cut from a different cloth than uh, most of you here. Uh, I am a liberal in, and I'm, I'm, if, you, if you heard some criticism uh, of currently acceptable uh, liberal uh, positions, uh, that's because I'm following the position mostly of uh, Aristotle and Tocqueville and Hannah Arendt, uh, and I'm actually quite critical of the tradition that starts with uh, Pico della Mirandola, uh, Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, and Kant. Uh, so uh, those of you who are fans of uh, the, the latter philosophers might uh, find exceptionally shocking my blank statements. Uh, Aristotle started his uh, career with a blank statement when he said uh, famously that man is a rational animal, unqualifiedly, there's no qualification here. He said man is a rational animal. Uh, it is very hard to even imagine a blanker statement than this or a more, uh, a, a larger generalization than this. Uh, and yet we are living on this. Uh, some of us hate this generalization 
some of us insist that this is indeed the benchmark that we should always return to. Uh, and this goes uh, uh, to Eva's question as well, uh, to the question whether human nature can be transformed or is it changeable. Uh, Rousseau thought it, it can be changed and uh, a lot of liberals of the latter mentioned uh, uh, tradition uh, accept Rousseau's idea that human, that we are uh, malleable, uh, that human nature can be changed, and this is what gives us hope uh, of progress, uh, that perhaps one day we can create a socialist man or a fascist man or whatever kind that we are dreaming about. Uh, uh, social justice can be created uh, eventually. Uh, the kind of social justice we are all dreaming about but never actually came into existence. So uh, political philosophy in the classical sense lives on blank generalizations of the sort that I just mentioned. Uh, and, uh, and whether uh, pluralism is is the, the saving invention of modernity, uh, pluralism as the essence of, of the modern concept of freedom, of course, is another large topic of, of discussion. Uh, one of the most uh, important uh, uh, starting point of this discussion is uh, Isaiah Berlin's two concepts of liberty. And in that uh, famous essay, uh, Berlin clearly makes a stand uh, on the side of pluralism, and uh, and if you if you are convinced by his arguments, then of course you will find what I say uh, very objectionable. But uh, but even uh, card carrying Kantian liberals uh, express great doubt. doing the same thing, so it's not me. So uh, if we put our faith into the idea of pluralism, we have to take Berlin's argument seriously in his two concepts of liberty. Uh, we also have to take the idea seriously that there is no, I mean, this goes back to the problem uh, expressed probably or maybe most clearly by Max Weber when he was talking about uh, about the impasse that modern rationalism came to, uh, where we can all be committed to our opinions. This is why, this is one reason I put up that cartoon about we are all qualified to fly this plane. Uh, in, in a, according to this concept of liberty, the negative liberty, which is, which Berlin defines as freedom from, from external intervention. This is the simplest way to define liberty. According to this one, uh, every opinion is equally valid as long as it doesn't disturb uh, the common peace. Uh, every lifestyle is equally acceptable as long as it, it remains within the framework of liberal democracy and the fundamental uh, precept of this liberal democracy is that everyone can pursue his or her idea of the good as long as he or she doesn't interfere with anybody else doing the same. So uh, critics of this uh, conception, of negative conception of liberty, will point out that this just doesn't seem to be enough for uh, for a society to hang together. The public good, this is why I emphasized 
the, the role of volunteerism in shaping the public good. If the public good is uh, what the public desires, then what was wrong in 1933 with the choice of the German people? I mean, that's what they desired. Most of them desired Hitler. Uh, so if there is, in other words, if there is no independent standard, and this goes also to the question of the irrationality or rationality of the masses. Uh, I think Hannah Arendt has very interesting, has very interesting analysis in his uh, book on totalitarianism, the origin of totalitarianism, uh, about the distinction between the mob and the masses. He says uh, something like this. He, he says the masses uh, are the people, uh, the, the mob are the people who uh, are simply excluded from the social structure. But the mass is created when the social structure itself collapses. And if she came, uh, if she could speak up today, uh, I can bet that she would say that this is exactly what we are experiencing in our celebration of pluralism, the collapse of the social structure, the moral and intellectual structure I'm talking about, or she would be talking about, uh, following in her Aristotelian traditions. And uh, if this is what, we, uh, this is the best we can do uh, with our modern liberalism, then, uh, then perhaps we should rethink the found foundations of this, uh, of this idea. So populism and uh, whether it's an ideology or movement, that probably is my mistake that I didn't emphasize it enough. Uh, Eva's question, I think she, she rightly wonders, uh, why I see a contradiction between the two, I don't. Uh, uh, I should have emphasized more that uh, while I see the origin of populism as an elitist idea or an aristocratic idea, uh, the, the uh, aristocrats instigated or, or set the people into motion by their uh, uh, political maneuvering and their ideology, uh, but of course, once uh, this uh, the people are set into motion, it's a movement, and this is this we see this repeated throughout history. Uh, Peron, Juan Peron, did the same thing in Argentina, and uh, and uh, our dear pre uh, prime minister in this country is doing the same thing. There is a uh, when he was in opposition, there was a movement, a very popular populist movement. Uh, in the countryside, mostly in the country, uh, organized in the countryside, uh, little uh, centers of uh, little political clubs were organized, and they were very effective in keeping hope alive that this wonderful political populist leader will one day return to power. So I don't see any uh, contradiction between ideology and uh, movement, and I don't uh, insist on uh, populism being one or the other. I'm just saying that there is a logical sequence. There is a asymmetry between the two. First comes to the, in history. First, it comes to the scene as an ideology, and then, of course, uh, uh, it can be a movement. Uh, so, the the uh, as far as the as, as human nature is concerned, this is of course a very large debate uh, between. Uh, Kantian liberals uh, or liberals of the Rousseau type and uh, and more uh, skeptical uh, liberals of uh, Tocqueville or Aristotle or Hannah Arendt's type. Uh, it's a very large question, but uh, just one thing at the end. Uh, I only have basically two sources uh, because when we talk about human nature, uh, this is largely an empirical question, obviously. Uh, uh, I have basically two sources, one very down-to-earth and, and one more abstract. The down-to-earth is my village uh, where I live with the other 49 people. Uh, and, uh, and the observations that I'm privileged to, to make in, in the life of this village 
uh, enforce or reinforce uh, my more theoretical uh, observations and more the and, and uh, knowledge obtained from more theoretical sources, and this is my other uh, empirical source, uh, the history of thinking in the past 2,500 ye years uh, seems to suggest that there is something uh, to the idea that, the, that people uh, are indeed more easily manipulated and trained than enlightened. Okay, thank you very much. I'm not sure if everyone is equally satisfied with all answers, but anyway, uh, we have to hurry up. Uh, it's been a long session this morning, almost three hours. It's 12 noon now, and we are going to have one more session, not two, one more session before the lunch, so we'll hurry up. Mm, thank you very much, Francois, Eva, and Janusz. Thank you for the audience for the patience and uh, activity. And see you again here in this room in 15 and not more than 15 minutes. Thank you. So this is the presentation I'm going to give you. Uh, what? And I'm supposed to be quick, fast. So here it goes. The red arrow shows. This is the popularity index of the ruling party, Fidesz. Uh, between 2014 up until very recently. The red yellow is the crucial part of my speech because that was when the popularity of Fidesz significantly, sharply, has decreased in a very long, during a very long period. That was really created a crisis for uh, Fidesz think tanks and Fidesz politicians. And they decided that something has to do because we have to have our power intact, full scale, and we have to have power it now. So they experimented with certain ideas. Uh, I wouldn't go into details now. But finally, they decided that they will use the immigrant card. They will create intentionally, and you will see, keep it for a long time, a sort of moral panic and institutionalize it in a way, sort of centralized propaganda format, that they can repeatedly uh, push this button, this institutionalized and centralized button, again and again, to keep the popularity index very high. And as you will see from the very beginning, this, by, this is by the way it could be the end of the story as well, that they succeeded, because the popularity of Fidesz is still extremely high, and it is not, uh, I think, I wouldn't say it only because, but definitely significantly due to this moral panic button structure. What moral panic is, is I think it's well known, so it's, there's nothing in it. It's a propaganda tool. Moral entrepreneurs come up with ideas, then they use stereotyping, they use the media uh, to make sure that all the people agree with them. They use framing and priming, use the, to, to, to send the message that what sort of words are uh, should be used, what sort of ideas should be spread. That's moral panic. There is nothing special in it. This is, I would say, basically the way how in the modern world or in the postmodern world, politics and media work. But moral panic button, that's something very different. That's a propaganda tool which exists for a long term, which has unlimited uh, financial resources. This is centralized. This is created by national and international think tanks These uh, who desire to, to, to serve as the central power this way, to keep their power and to, make, to maximize the popularity of it. It contains various direct marketing techniques. What is important to realize that it goes beyond the media. It's not just media manipulation. They have techniques, direct marketing techniques, which by which they reach all the households, all the individuals, all the, all the, all the citizens uh, entering into actually into their home, their life. The, the, you will see later that the, the concrete examples are the so-called national consultations, referendum, and even the parliamentary election were used for this sake. Uh, I already 
summarize a little bit. This is the summary of the story of the moral panic button pressing in Hungary between 2015 and 2019. I don't have the time to go through it, but it's not necessarily. What is important to realize only that there have been 17 pressings of the button, this, uh, which doesn't mean that in between these pressings there were no media manipulation, anti-immigration, anti, anti uh, uh, various antis uh, during in the media, but these were the, those 17 cases which we could, by a very detailed content analysis, uh, identified as single cases with a, a, a beginning and an ending, where they again and again, repeatedly and in a cumulative format, used the same terms, you, uh, selected the same scapegoat, combined new stories on the top of already existing stories to edit it and uh, already existing uh, structure. So that's the moral panic bottom, how it works. Well, you can re read it in the book, Elizabeth Orga. This is a, this slide is a, is a is a chart in that book, so you can read it if you want. It's open resource. What is important are the I would just add the red uh, signs. Those were those direct marketing techniques I mentioned already, which goes beyond media manipulation. I just emphasize it because they are extremely efficient in my way. Just to give you examples, these are two examples, two messages which were focusing and which were used in the first uh, pressing of the of the moral panic button in 2015 already. Uh, these are just for sociologists. Undergraduate sociologists, first class sociology, we teach it, this is how you shouldn't do. This is how when you uh, when you create a uh, questionnaire, these are strictly forbidden. These are the sins of, 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 of public opinion research. But in this case, because these were not, these national consultations were actually push polls. A push poll is a technique when you don't, you are not really interested in the answers, what you are interested in to send a message, what you want them to understand and to learn and to, to impose upon their thinking. I won't go into details. If you are interested, again, you are welcome to read the book. <laughs> this is pressing six. We are already well into the 17, the middle of the 17 pressings. But this was just another sort of information campaign, making sure that the information is one-sided, mostly using fake news. But what is more important, uh, just as a, a new version of the already uh, used uh, framing techniques, reinforcing the already used primes. Uh, this is a referendum. This is pressing eight. We are half time. This is half time now. Uh, pressing ten to twelve. The reason why uh, I, I cover these three pressings into a single case because they were in fact overlapping. I don't go into details, but it was give, that gave them an extra strength to send a message using this type of informer. A new uh, scapegoat was discovered. The original scapegoat were just the so-called illegal migrants, but that was not good enough because it was a, a, a faceless mess. That's not what was good enough. So, more concrete enemies of the sovereignty of the Hungarian state should have been added as scapegoats. Again, let me emphasize added, not replace it, but added. First came uh, the European Union, then came Soros, then came the Euro United Nations, and all the time the civil society. This is, this is the main passage of the parliamentary election, which means that instead of instead of discussing important issues during the parliamentary elections, the same moral panic button was pushed again, this is 13, to make sure that the discussion will be on immigration and all the party leaders, at that time party leaders, were described as the puppets of Soros, who is the main culprit worldwide and the source of every evil and every devious design against the Hungarian 
soul, the Hungarian culture, Christianity, European, Europeanness, and, and whatever. And the UN campaign, uh, and this is all the end of the story. This is uh, the two last messages. Uh, now, what I just want to, the last five minutes I <laughs> want to use to show you uh, uh, the results of our content analysis. This is a huge data set. We covered the entire period between 2015 and 2019. We, uh, 10 uh, media outlets, some 40, some hundreds, uh, sorry, thousands articles and 8 million words. It's a huge discourse analysis we did. Uh, these are the number of articles containing the terms illegal and migrant together. That was the basic term which was used to label the, the, the basic culprit, the basic population. Uh, the black are the governmental sources. Uh, the, the green is a non-governmental but, but, but the right, right wing. And the, the, the blue are the non-governmental sources. You can see that illegal and migrant together uh, were overrepresented significantly in governmental sources. So that was part of the, the framing technique. What did I do now? <sighs> I don't have time to go into details. This is a result of a natural experiment. The natural experiment, thanks for the Hungarian government, occurred during this period of his investigation because there is a, a media outlet, a, a website called Origo, uh, and it was originally an independent uh, website, but in 2017 or 16, it was taken by an oligarch, oligarch close to the Hungarian state, so it was converted into a pro-government source. And thanks to this chance event, since we had a, a, a continuous data on the way how the articles in Origo were appearing, uh, we used this data set as a natural experiment to prove that actually they changed in the course of shifting from an independent source to a pro-governmental source. Their whole framing techniques, the words were changed, the labels were changed, the whole uh, technology, how they talked about uh, immigrants has changed due to moving closer to the government agency, agencies, think tanks, and being dominated by the moral panic button. Uh, the effect, this is more or less the end of the story when I finished my webinar, web, webinar lecture. So this is the plus <laughs> for those who listen to that. The first one is the impact of this whole story, well, the impact of moral panic button in the short run. This is from the European Social Survey. This shows that the Hungarian, that the, the Hungarian line is the gray one. Uh, since 2002, the Hungarian line is always significantly above the other countries, which showed an increase of, in, of, uh, of uh, xenophobia. However, so there is a, I would say, a culturally embedded basis of the moral panic button, moral panic button. So the government chose quite well when they decided to use the inbuilt already existing high level xenophobia of the Hungarian population as a basis of their moral panic button activity. But what is important to after 2015, in other countries there has been some non very significant increase of uh, xenophobia, but in case of Hungary it's skyrocketed. And this skyrocketing is definitely an empirical proof of the result of the moral panic button. That's my favorite. Just very briefly, I selected three countries. <coughs> what is important, you cannot read it and it's not important for you to read it. What is important, just follow the lines. It shows the basic socio-demographic characteristic of a public opinion survey of the, of the society, the Portuguese, the UK, and the uh, Austrian societies. And you see that there is a sort of oscillation. There are certain social groups with higher than average and other groups with lower than average level of xenophobia. I would say that's normal. I can even, without knowing anything about Portugal, explain it to you in detail because that's how in modern times things work. 
And this is the Hungarian. No deviation from the standard. All the social groups in Hungary think the same way. This is, in my view, the ultimate proof of the moral panic button, but it just dis destroy thinking. It even destroy self-interested type of articulation of your position because it overrules differences. Everybody has to think in the same way, and Hungarians do. It's a long story. It's from a survey. You can see that there are differences, increasing differences, which means uh, this is uh, from a public opinion survey. Perhaps this is the most interesting items. Which do you consider to be the major danger for Hungary? And uh, the difference is, again, the opposition, the, the, the center, let's say, and the pro-government. That's the important thing, the, the difference between the blue and the gray. And you can see that the media consumption very efficiently uh, defines how you think about dangers. Because if you read uh, uh, extra, uh, if you are uh, from the, on, the, on the governmental side, then you see external threat and Soros as the main danger of, of, of the Hungarian future or near future. If you are from the opposition, <laughs> then of course you see uh, that the current ruling at it is the main danger. So there is a sort, while there is no differences as far as the migration uh, or immigration is concerned, when it comes to fear, then your political position uh, defines your opinion, and this segments in a sort of bifurcation. So there are two two segments of the Hungarian society, and there is no way in between, no compromise between them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sheik, and thank you for keeping the time. Um, we had a wonderful webinar by Professor Sheik a few weeks ago. It is on YouTube. Please do watch it. It's worth watching it. And now I would like to ask Professor Demilovic to present his paper. Yeah, good. My, my English is not so good to be very flexible with, uh, and so I, but I have, I'm asked to, to be very short, so it's a difficult task to do. But to give you an idea what my approach is, I just referred to my background, what is the critical theory, or partly it's critical theory, and the studies in prejudice, so that means the reference to the studies on the authoritarian personality, the critical theorists did in the 30s and 40s, mostly in the Californian exile. So they don't speak about German. Very often the book is read as um, something on Germany, but it's on the United States. And what they found out was that anti-Semitism in the US was much more to be found than in Germany or in in, in France, also France has more anti-Semitism in their eyes than Germany. And what the lesson is, in my eyes, this is following your thesis, that it de everything depends on not the attitude among the people in the population, but it depends on the elites, the ruling classes. This is what, your, what was one of your... I think important thesis, and what is a, in a way critical what about what we heard yesterday, because sociologists like to do a lot of research on the why to to the how to say what normal people think, and in my eyes it doesn't matter. Anti-Semitism was stronger in the U.S. than in Germany. It depends on what the ruling class do. And in Germany, they followed in a coalition. Yeah, it was the voters for Hitler were about 30%, a little bit more. But the relevant point was that there was a coalition constructed yeah, by, by with the, how to say, the bourgeois parties, not only the National Socialists. So, and so then everybody knew that the, what the aims of the Nazis was, yeah, or where, have been, 
and uh, what the coalition is about. And for my, for my, in my view, this is important with regard to populism, because I, or the whole way how I'm approaching this, because I would say the problem for the German society, but the argument is also true for other democratic societies, is that the authoritarian persons are, in a way, always conformists, and they are conformed to power. And in democratic societies, democracy, liberalism, parliamentarism is the power that they have to be conformed with. And, but they are always in this tension of being power-oriented and bound to authoritarianism. And um, so you have this both, both, yeah, this kind of contradiction inside people. And I think what populists and other right-wing parties and actors, leaders, yeah, the people who are organizing moral panics, um, as we heard before, they make use of this kind of contradiction people have to live with. So this is one aspect. The second aspect is that I want to say that, or to say when you look at these traditions, I want to say the tradition is there all over the decade. It's nothing new under the sun. Yeah, I mean, I don't go back to the ancient periods, but we can have we can see that there's a strong continuity since the 19th century, and in Germany in particular with this kind of current, we can see it since the 20s, and it's always about 20 to 25 percent of the population that follow these kind of attitudes, you know. So, and this kind of, <clears throat> of um, of contradiction, and this contradiction after World War II and after the Nazi regime and after the Holocaust, of course, this kind of censorship is very strong. People have to commit, and even, and I think, so in my eyes, also for, this is also true for France and other European countries, because the, the Holocaust was organized by the Germans, but so many other nations helped to do it. I mean, so, like in France, like in Belgium, like in Hungary, and so on and so on. So there is this kind of tension everywhere. And, um, and so populism, in my eyes, is something that helps to modernize the right. And I think you and others here with your presentation, they, they support this kind of thesis, yeah? That you can't say, I, look, I'm a racist, and I'm like Steve Bannon. Yeah, when he came to France, then he offered to the F Front National people, if they criticize you as a racist, be proud of being a racist. You know, this was what he said at this conference, and the same he did in Switzerland. Yeah, so he, it was kind of a tour through this part of Europe. And, but you can't say it. They will, would lose, and I think you're... Yeah, Francois, yours and, and your talk demonstrate this. Yeah, they would lose a lot of uh, voters immediately. Yeah, because of the strong institutionalized censorship on on racism and so on. So populism, in my eyes, is a way to avoid this impasse and to modernize modernize the right. You know, so so. But for me, that means to follow the argument of critical theory. Authoritarianism is something that is like a syndrome. It's not, I mean, it's not only nationalism against populism. It's not nationalism against racism. It's, so what I want to say is that in different conjunctures, constellations, the right can be able or enables itself to put forward one of these aspects, being more racist, being more nationalist, being more at, at um, how to say, tribalist, I would prefer ethnocentric, yeah, for that. But you know, so you know what I mean. So it depends on what is the assessment of the public debate and what is in, in strategic terms 
more useful. And I like very much your idea of the more, um, moral panic button because I think this is, makes very clear, and as some yesterday also argued, that these people are smart. They know what they do. They have a very clear sense of what the... So as Adorno and Horkheimer already put it, it, they are in a way cynical. They have, it's not for them, it's not important being themselves convinced by racism. I believe they are racists, yeah, but it's not the, I mean, this is not the most important point because I think they make use of it as in so far as they need it. So, but my following or the consequence or part of this argument is to say, all these ideolo ideologies are present yeah, and at stake, and it depends on which one is the, how to say, the dominant yeah, in this whole um, syndrome. And the next part of my argument is what we have since the 20s in a long-lasting continuity in always shifting and changing forms are right parties. We have the movement groups of the right, you know. We have um, people organizing as right movements, even militant, uh, that means training violence, yeah, so like hooligans, yeah, and um, but others, you know, who do, who do it as part of their, how to say, how of their political attitude. We have the music events and record labels yeah, in, in Germany and I think also in Switzerland and other countries. We have the publishers and bookstores and lifestyle stores offering the clothes. We have the newspapers and journals like the weekly Junge Freiheit in Germany that is very important as, a, as an organ or an instrument to translate a lot of French new right stuff into German and make it popular among the right. We have the think tanks and institutes, and we have the intellectuals, yeah, so in the right. So this is what is, and these people are more or less since decades, they are there, they are existing, and they're fighting for having more influence in the German society, and they always looking for new strategies, how they can be successful. Yeah. What we experienced in the last few years with the success of the um, IFD, the Alternative for Germany, is that they also get a lot of support from the state apparatuses, the different police yeah, units, agencies, yeah, intelligence inter agencies. Yeah, like um, um, one of the directors of the German Constitutional Verfassungsschutz, for Secret Service for Protecting the Constitution, you know. So, and he now shows that he is very sympathetic with this idea that the Merkel government lost completely the control over the, the boundaries, so, yeah, the borders, yeah, sorry. And um, so and so, in my eyes, he gave a lot. He he invested a lot or helped a lot these right wingers. So, to to, to yeah, okay, it would be go too far to follow all these problems. So what I already said, I think, see populism as a strategy to modernize the right. And and then I think it is not. The reason for that, for the success, is not the migration wave in 2015. When we see what happened in Germany, the, the alternative for um, Germany it was founded in 2013 with regard to the euro and the criticism of the euro strategy, that means the currency, and what was really kind of a right mass populist mass mobilization was Pegida, and this started to begin in October 14. You know, it was so more or less a year 
before. And then we had already, before that, we had the manifestations in front of the Brandenburger Tor with a lot of, how to say, in the first instance, crazy people believing in conspiracy theory, in chem chemtrails stuff, and you know all this, you know? So, um, okay. So, when we refer to the concept of populism, I have nothing original to say with regard to this concept. So I could refer to Jan Werner Müller or Karl Smutte just to make it very short. For my argument, what is very important is the critique of domination, one aspect, the, the below above differentiation. Yeah? This is, in my eyes, an uh, important, the anti-elitist yeah, um, attitude or program. What includes really a serious criticism of domination. It, the, the, uh, the alternative for Germany is very clear about it. Yeah, that they think, okay, these are dominant people. They have the control over the stat apparatus, and then they do everything against the people. And then all what you told us yesterday about great replacement and all these things, this comes in, you know, to, to give support to this argument. We are dominated by those elites or what they prefer to speak in terms of political class. And political class, in my understanding, is a, is a concept or not a concept. It's an expression that goes back to Gaetano Mosca and it was part of the fascist Italian movement. So, and for them, that means political class. It's a class for its own, yeah? trying to get the power and completely independent from all the rest of the society. Okay, so they see themselves as critical, but and this is, in my eyes, for the way how populism works, an, an interesting point, because I think that they make use of what Adorno and Horkheimer already called rebellious conformism. You can, at the same time, critiquing, critiquing the domination, a class, yeah, you can reject the way how we live, but at the same time, you never criticize the circumstances, the life conditions you are living in. And to be very short, I mean capitalism, accumulation, profit. Be because you can criticize Merkel as a dominant class person. And look, they never criticize CEOs from banks. Merkel earns per year 260 thousand euros. A CEO of the German bank, even are they more or less bankrupt, yeah, gets five million, six million, you know. At, at the best time, one of the CEOs of the UBS, the biggest bank in, in Switzerland, what was supported by public uh, uh, subsidies of about 68 billion Swiss francs, Franken, yeah, the CEO got per year 30 million. But these facts are never part of the view of the right. So they criticize some of the political actors and, and criticize them as um, manipulative and, um, and dominating. But, you know, in my eyes, it's a kind of a shift, shifting the perspective away from the relevant social relations people live in. Okay, though <clears throat> I, I skip the part on pluralism, and I just want to mention that part of this is the reference to traditionalism. It was also, also said before, and I would just want to stress it, that this is a kind of a self-affirmative attitude, yeah, to refer to the gender difference, 
being a male, being a female, and to fight against, in, in Germany, it was one of the most important starting points of the, uh, in the last years for the mobilization of the right, to fight against um, new forms of sexual orientations, of um, gender equality, and different um, forms of partnerships, you know, so this may be of interest. Yeah, so they want to be traditional and they want, like Alexander Gauland says, we want to have back the Germany of our fathers and mothers. And imagine what that means, yeah, for the German tradition. Two wars, yeah, and so on and so on. Yeah, so it's, I mean, this is the way how they deal with the problem of the German history. Okay, the last point, the third point that I also can refer to Jan Werner Müller is what, but he speaks of representation. Leaders are present, representing a basis, the voters, elect, electorate. I would say they don't represent it. Yeah, they are not interested in representing. I mean, I take it serious. <coughs> what Trump is saying, I'm your voice. I mean, it's a kind of a shortcut. There is no will formation, no, no debate. There is no, no process of representation. It's just, I'm the one who knows what is good for. You, you mentioned that before, yeah? That what is the public good? I think Donald Trump knows it. Yeah, Strache knows it. And maybe others, you know, like Le Pen or so. Oh, now Macron, what I see him as a liberal populist, you know, he also avoids the will formation processes in the party, you know. So, but okay, I'm not so familiar with that. But just to stress this point, that is, I see it as a, a, a shortcut between people above, yeah, the ruling people and people below. And this is, in my eyes, a strategy, and why, and this was a question you had before in the discussion, why now, why in the last, why there is so, so much success for these groups? It's not a result of their smart strategies. We, many actors have smart strategies, by, but they are not successful. So, and um, it is not at all clear if they are finally successful, when you think of Strache, Strache's failure in Austria, also Salvini's defeat in Italy, so it's a, or what happened in the Netherlands, it's a kind of a force and back, but so it's not so clear. So in my eyes, this is why I refer to the concept of other authoritarian populism. I refer to this argument Stuart Hall made in the in the 80s with regard to Thatcherism and saying that there is a kind of an equilibrium of social forces in our society. The, the idea of an equilibrium of social forces he, he was arguing for goes back, of course, to Gramsci. And, and um, he had in mind, and I think this, this situation today is uh, different, he had in mind um, a two-class constellation, a ruling class and a kind of working class socialist movement. And there is a kind of an interregnum, what means the new is possible, but it's not prepared. And now people have to prepare themselves and to go for it and to, to bring that forward. In my eyes, the problem is after the finance crisis, different. And we have not, so I have to be very short, but I don't speak only of a crisis of the finance markets after 2007 and 8, but I also I have argue that we are in the middle of a multiple crisis. We have also a crisis of political democracy, we have a crisis of ecology and climate and so on. We have a crisis in, in the educational system. Yeah, so and so, how to say, about seven, eight, nine, ten different forms of crisis in the reproduction of our society. And the right is, and the, the how to say, liberals and right are very sensitive about it. And one of the 
spokespersons of German, how to say, the bourgeois camp, the director of the most important uh, German uh, newspaper, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Yeah, is that, yeah, you, you are a little bit familiar with that? Frank Schirmacher, he died a year, some years ago, and he argued that if after the crisis, he published an article, and this is, gives you an, 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 an hint yeah, in which way the, this camp saw the problems, interpreted the problems. He, what was he basically saying was, the left is right. Also, right. I mean, in, they, they did it good in their analyses. Yeah? So, um, so, and also the same is true for the, for the economic self-organization institution in Switzerland, more or less neoliberal orientated, Karin Centinetta. She published a book saying that capitalism is not, not, nothing what people like to have anymore. Yeah? So for them, it was very clear that capitalism can, cannot go further like this. And you can see the, all these summit, um, summit um, um, how to say, slogans, yeah, when the finance ministers meet and now in the meetings in Davos with the World Economic Forum, you could say they have a very clear sense of a deep crisis in the re reproduction of our society, with, in particular with regard to ecology, but they have no solution for it. They're looking for solutions now for more than 20 years, yeah, maybe even longer. I mean, when you remember the 92 Earth Summit, yeah, you can see there is a really uh, a, a good sense of the problems, but nothing is solved in the last 30 years. So much time is lost. And when you go back to the reports of the Club of Rome, in the early 70s, you could say, you refer to this, our view on the Earth as a planet, as a, um, how to say, not an endless, but a limited planet. Yeah, that means we know it now since 50 years. Yeah, and even important economists in Germany, um, Edward, um, how to say, beraten, Beraten, was it beraten? Yeah, yeah, counseling the government. They say, yeah, we lost a lot of time. We lost a lot of time, and, and, and the costs will amazing, yeah? And, and so it, it's not at all clear what the outcome will be. So for that reason, I think we have to, to see these developments in the context of, an, of neoliberalism since the 80s. Yeah, this would be my argument. The framework of the development and the success is the impasses of neoliberalism since the 2007 and 8 crisis after two periods of liberalism, and I follow here the argument of Jamie Peck and Tickle, they make a difference between the first stage, what was the rollback period of neoliberalism, and then we had, since the early 90s, we had the, uh, the roll-out form of neoliberalism, and Nancy Fraser spoke of that period as a progressive neoliberal, progressive neoliberal and period. And I think since, since uh, nine, 2008 and 2009 period, we are in a new period of neoliberal development. And I think this is a long debate now, is, there, is this still neoliberalism? Yeah? And this is not so clear. And I, I'm arguing for, for neoliberalism, and I think what people like Trump and also Macron, and what you're experiencing now with, the, <coughs> with the, the, the concept of the pension reform, Macron is uh, planning, yeah, um, based on papers by BlackRock, and our candidate for the successor of Merkel, he's also part of BlackRock. Yeah? I don't want to reduce it to that. Don't, um, I see that would be a problem, but just to say that there is a whole constellation of interest groups fighting for, for this. And, and I would say the, to make use of the right 
ja, the um, alternative for Germany is, as you said, it's a kind of a strategic instrument. You can use it. Yeah, you can, and they have a very good access to newspapers, to talk shows, to the TV. As um, I think you mentioned it yesterday, the guy who who in in the French TV every day on at six, yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was him. So, th so this is, um, I think, what we're experiencing too. That it's very <laughs> evident that, yeah, how to say that the problem is created by the migrants, by the refugees, by um, so and so. This is the way how it's interpreted. And when you think. It's not only the labor market competition, it's also the ecological issue, like it was the, the argument before, but look why, like, like the populist party in Switzerland is arguing power plants, nuclear power plants are only necessary because there are so many migrants. They use the energy. So, okay, so far my short insight in my argumentation. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Professor Demirovic, for this uh, somewhat short and then yet uh, wonderful presentation. The message was only for you, uh, Andreas, thank you. Uh, and now I would like to ask uh, my friend uh, Francois to uh, conclude uh, this uh, day. Um, we started up today with uh, Francois's uh, presentation and we will end up uh, with his presentation, but this time his presentation will be much, much, much shorter. Thank you. Okay, yes, so uh, indeed I'm going to try to sort of wrap it up in 10 minutes. Uh, uh, so, and, and basically uh, it might be awkward to see uh, me on the stage for a second time today, but the initial plan was that this was supposed to be a co-presentation with my colleague from Nova Migra, uh, Johanna Gordemann, she's a PhD student at, at Duisburg Essen, and she's a political philosopher working on, on, on the ethics of migration. And so what we did together in our, in our work in, in the Nova Migra project is to look at the link between Europe and the global compacts, the global compact on migration and the global compacts on, on, on the, the, the refugees. Uh, um, and we did two things with this regard. We looked at the EU's position vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the global compact. So what was the EU's input in sort of the legislative process uh, uh, leading to uh, uh, the two compacts? And we looked at the levels of the, the member states, uh, especially focusing on, on, on populist parties or nationalist parties or nationalist uh, anti-immigration movement to see what was their reaction against the compacts and what was their, their argument. And so one key finding that, that we arrived at is that both at the EU level and at the level of nationalist movements in the member states, there was a strong, very strong emphasis on the notion of emphasizing sovereignty. Uh, um, so, uh, um, yeah, I, I had slides, uh, PowerPoint slides detailing the, the, the uh, input of the EU, but in a nutshell, uh, uh, what the EU did uh, uh, in its input uh, uh, in the legislative process that led to the global compacts was to ask, especially for the, the with regard to the global compacts uh, uh, on migrants, was to ask for two key reforms. One was that there should be a stronger inclusion of the principle of national sovereignty, and this would mean that states should be guaranteed uh, uh, the right to decide who is a regular and who is an irregular uh, uh, immigrant. So that was very really important for uh, uh, the European Union. The second thing they did was to uh, uh, manage to get uh, uh, a clear statement that, that states have duties to readmit uh, uh, migrants. And so at the level of the nationalist movement in the member states, also the, the dominant framework to oppose both global compacts was that both compacts were a threat to uh, uh, the sovereignty of those states. So basically, the language was that there was a sort of a conspiration by, by international elites uh, uh, in the UN and in the UNHCR, more precisely, to sort of force uh, uh, countries to uh, accept more migrants and more uh, uh, refugees. Um, so it, it's important to emphasize that both compacts are, are strictly non-binding. 
Uh, they are not something akin to the Geneva Convention, not at all. They just make like very vague list of, of, of objectives and principles. They list key uh, best practices that should be followed. They explain how different state and non-state actors should coordinate to have a, a better uh, answer to the, 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 the migration and, and refugee crisis. And more specifically, the Global Compact on Refugees establishes a, a common framework of responsibility sharing, for the sharing of, of, of money for people, uh, countries who receive a lot of refugees, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, a framework to uh, uh, have a resettlement scheme, but one that is strictly uh, uh, voluntary. So that's very important uh, 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 to remember. Uh, yes. Uh, um, so, uh, um, so this is what the, the, the again what the EU managed to do was to indeed uh, 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 entrench in, in you know, there were several drafts of the Global Compact on Migration to entrench the, the national sovereignty principle, the duty of, of, of to, to uh, readmit uh, 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 migrants. Um, I'm going to leave it there for now, and I'm going to jump very very quickly. I know this is a bit brutal but to the nationalist reaction in, in several uh, member states to show that they also uh, emphasized uh, 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 this idea of, of, of sovereignty. Uh, uh, and so despite the fact that the EU managed to get those uh, reforms for, for the final draft of the Global Compact on Migration, it seems that those nationalist movements simply didn't uh, uh, read this. And so there was a lot of disinformation uh, uh, in their discourse and even in the official statement of, of, of states who sort of uh, either voted against or, or abstained for voting uh, uh, to, uh, for the, the, the global compacts on migration and the refugees. I have to make one more precision. Uh, so there were 11 states that, that either voted against the global compact on migration or didn't vote and nine of them were in the Europe. So that was why we decided to focus on Europe and the global compacts in the first place. There seemed to be a concentration of opposition to the, the, the global compact uh, uh, at the EU. So as I said uh, earlier, the, the framework that was really dominant for the justification of, of rejecting the global compacts was a narrative of sovereignty, this idea that, that you know, international law is going to force states to receive migrants, to protect them, uh, undermine their capacity to distinguish between uh, uh, regular and irregular immigrants, and so on and so forth. Um, so the two first countries that, that did uh, uh, pull out of, of those deals were, were the US and, and Hungary. Uh, uh, so just <clears throat> the US were the first, so I'm, I'm just going to read there the, an excerpt from the, the uh, uh, U.S. ambassador to the U.N. who claimed that their decision to withdraw from the, the negotiation leading to the Global Compact on Migration uh, was that our decision on immigration policies must always be made by Americans and Americans alone. We will decide how best to control our borders uh, uh, and who will be allowed to enter in our country or not. Um, with regard to Hungary, Orban said that those compacts were a serious danger to Europe and that it was aiming at legalizing illegal migration as a fundamental human rights. Uh, uh, and as I said, neither of the compacts were a, like a new bill of rights. They, they're just list of, of best practices and so on and so forth. Uh, just to, to keep on going there, in Austria, uh, uh, Chancellor Kurtz uh, uh, had a slightly different uh, narrative, but it still involved the notion of sovereignty. His argument was that those compacts opened the door for uh, judicial activism. So the idea that judges, when they are faced with uh, 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 constitutional provisions or law that are, are a bit vague, can sort of manage their way to push their own personal values and ideology. And they claim that judges, uh, as a, a group, tend to be more progressist, more pro-migrants, and, and that those compacts would uh, uh, enable them to uh, uh, especially at the level of the European Court of Justice, to pass on decisions uh, that were too favorable for migrants. And this would, this is the idea, undermine national sovereignty, the capacity of the state to enact its own legislation in the field of, of, of migration and refugee protection. <clears throat> uh, same thing in Poland, the law and justice government uh, uh, claimed that the, the global compacts on migration simply fails to provide strong guarantees Govern, uh, regarding the sovereign right to decide 
who is illegal, who is an illegal uh, uh, immigrant. And again, this is a bit awkward since the EU managed to, to shape the, the uh, uh, global compact on migration exactly on this point, giving exactly what uh, 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 law and justice were uh, asking for. In Germany, the IFD also uh, uh, talked about the risk of judicial activism due to the uh, vagueness of the compacts. Uh, <clears throat> and they uh, also invoked, uh, uh, that was very curious, the collective right to cultural self-determination to claim that that state such as Germany should be able to be culturally self-determining and that the global compacts would undermine that. Uh, in Belgium, the uh, NVA uh, uh, claim, and this is a quote, the house of democracy is located in Brussels and not in Marrakech. Uh, again, so we're losing sovereignty. Decisions are being taken by the, the UN and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, in France, the Rassemblement National, uh, uh, Marine Le Pen claimed that uh, the both compacts were the work of contemptuous oligarchs. So many of them still uh, uh, embrace this framework of national populism uh, uh, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so what Joanna and I did in our work, so we started from there, <clears throat> and in a first piece that we published, uh, it's a blog post, uh, very short, on the uh, uh, website of Nova Migra, we sort of commented on the transnational dimension of this nationalist reaction to the, the global compacts. <clears throat> but what we mean by this is that there seems to be a strong convergence in the kinds of arguments and the rhetoric that is being mobilized uh, uh, by groups who oppose the global compacts. So there seems to be an irony in the fact that they are all saying, oh, we're losing our, our right to cultural self-determination or capacity to maintain our cultural distinctiveness because of this globalist project led by cosmopolitan elites, but actually they all defend uh, or they all have the same discourse. So they are, uh, in a sense, agents of homogenization. Uh, 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 in the field of, of you know, public policy, public values, and so on and so forth. But this is perhaps a, a bit more superficial. What we found when we uh, uh, <clears throat> looked especially at reports produced by data scientists who looked at, at uh, a media coverage of, of the global compacts was that there was a sudden burst uh, uh, in media coverage around October 2018. So the, so the decision... Uh, 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 to sign uh, the Global Compacts on Migration uh, was done in December 2018 uh, um, in Marrakech, of course. And, and this process had started in 2016. And for two years, there was almost no coverage uh, in the news. And then it sort of exploded at the last minute. So many people were wondering, OK, what, what happened there? And many were able to trace. Uh, uh, and we looked especially at, at the <clears throat> studies uh, performed by the Institute of Strategic Dialogue in London, <clears throat> where again, data scientists were able to show that actually there was a, a, a there seemed to be coordination uh, uh, on YouTube accounts, Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts, uh, uh, by different groups of activists that roughly fits uh, uh, what Jean-Yves qualified as the identitarian movement uh, 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 yesterday. Uh, for instance, uh, a lot seems to be traceable to a, an Austrian activist, Martin Sellner, produced a couple of videos saying, okay, this is a big issue, we should talk about it, this is a threat to a, a, a national sovereignty. And those uh, data scientists were able to show how in the hours and days after those first publications, other groups in the identitarian framework started reposting the same message, producing similar message, uh, uh, about the threat to sovereignty and so on and so forth. So there seems to be a coordinated effort to put this issue on the agenda, to push for the narrative of, of sovereignty and so on and so forth. So it's not merely uh, uh, <clears throat> that there is sort of a parallel convergence in the rhetorics and arguments. There seems to be a coordinated uh, uh, effort that has been uh, measured again by uh, data scientists uh, who also claim that on, on online forums that they have been able to uh, infiltrate or, or those that are open. There seems to be a lot of, of information sharing going on, sharing about best practices, <clears throat> uh, even joint operations, uh, uh, like, like media stunts, such as the Defend Europe operation, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And so 
this coordination uh, uh, in the digital era seemed to point that uh, uh, many <clears throat> of those nationalist movements who have a strongly anti-immigration discourse uh, are greatly interconnected and that they are not like parallel bubbles. And again, there is a great irony in this uh, uh, situation since uh, uh, all of them are claiming that international elites are trying to shape policies in their own country, but they actually constitute such an international network of elites uh, uh, using uh, uh, different techniques uh, 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 to shape uh, 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 public opinion. <clears throat> and so to conclude very, very quickly uh, in two minutes, <clears throat> what we did, uh, uh, so in another paper, a bit more substantial and more philosophical, was to develop an internal normative critique of this narrative of sovereignty. Uh, so we didn't just make the point that, well, this is a threat to human rights uh, and so on and so forth. We said that, okay, if you really care about sovereignty, you should support the global compacts. And we sort of developed two arguments for this, uh, both starting from the premise that the value of sovereignty is that it enables self-determination or national self-determination. Uh, uh, sovereignty is not a value in itself, it's a means to achieve democratic self-determination. And so self-determination as a democratic ideal claims that people who are subjected to different laws or are affected by those laws should have a say in those laws. And so if you really value self-determination, what it should lead you to as a conclusion is to say that migrants and refugees who are the main people who are affected by those decisions should have a greater say uh, 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 in this process, and it's not clear that their voice has been uh, uh, <clears throat> fully included uh, uh, in both uh, uh, process, at least not at as the same extent as states have been since they were primary actors uh, uh, in the negotiation leading to the global compacts uh, uh, on migration. And uh, we have another argument based on, on the fact that sovereignty is constituted by the international state system, and as such, the international community is totally fully legitimate in enacting uh, legislation and rules that can place certain limits on, on national sovereignty, just as the same way as individual right and individual liberties is something that is only possible in the state with the rule of law and so on and so forth. Uh, so I can develop maybe in the question period. I want to uh, uh, finish now because uh, uh, we are way behind uh, in terms of time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francois. I would like to ask uh, Professor Sheik and Professor Demirovic to be seated here at the panel, so because we have a f just a few minutes discussion, but let's uh, capitalize on that. So I um, may ask you if anyone would like to have a comment, questions, just in case, a few minutes. We still have a few minutes. Would you? Yes, yes please. Could you please put the mic? No, so my colleague will do that. Thank you. A short question, please. Okay. Thank so you. the really short version is just, I mean, it's a very broad question, but the short version would be, I mean, some of you have been talking about exclusively right-wing nationalist populism. Some of you have also been kind of talking about left-wing populism somehow. You were showing in your last talk, you showed that populism index, which was got created at the end, which I think was done by several researchers uh, across Europe. Is that the same thing? Okay, because I, I know a similar index. Okay, oh no, that is, but it, it showed it. I know a similar index that tried to an, an, an analyze uh, popular speeches around the world. Um, and what came out of it was somehow that Hugo Chavez was the most populist leader in the world, closely followed by Brazil's Lula, who was the second one. And like, even people like Viktor Orban kind of came somewhere down the line. And you can kind of, so wonder what the concept of populism is doing to somehow then kind of equalize left-wing populism and right-wing populism. Um, it has this obvious kind of derogatory sense of you know, saying it somehow distorts the previously intact balance between liberalism and democracy, and, and there is some distortion in populism to that, and we have that both on the left and on the right. And I kind of wonder, I mean, also what you said, Alex, um, kind of about populism, 
whether uh, you use the term, whether you would actually think it's useful to keep up the term or not just call it kind of ethno-nationalism if you talk about right-wing populism. Um, that would be the short version of the question. Thank you very to... much for your understanding. Any other question? Thank you. Then that was the question. Please give uh, the answer. Yes, please. For, for Francois, uh, I just wanted to ask it. It's interesting that they're able to coordinate their message, but what we do not see yet, and so that's a very open question, but at the European level, at least, they don't seem to be able to coordinate their public policies yet. And for a very good reason is that they are nationalists, so they defend their national interest first, and sometimes those national interests clash. So I take the example of Sal Salvini's policy versus the policies that are taken in the Visegrad group or in Hungary, where Salvini asks stridently for some support in Greece uh, in the redistribution of or the re resettlement of the refugees, what we see is that because they are nationalists, they can't agree on this. So do you think that this coordination in message is, is sort of, is gonna lead to further coordination at the public policy level? Or do you think that there is a threshold that then they, they're never going to cross there? Okay, great question. The last one, please, short one. Okay. Yeah, so I would like to ask uh, you, Alex, uh, so uh, referring to uh, conformism. So uh, you said that the key point in authoritarian uh, attitude is conformism. And I'd like uh, to ask if uh, we can detect the uh, moment of personal decision behind conformism as the root of conformism. I think in, theoretical, in a theoretical perspective, it's a very important point because it refers to the concept of evil, for example, by ha for evil, uh, because uh, the banality of evil, for example, by Hannah Arendt, who, who said in conformism, we can't detect any decision it is that just the ad adoption ad or adaptation to the situation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> to the last point, for the critical theory at that time, it was a, an explanation with psychoanalytical concepts. That means, you know, the uh, erosion an erosion of the family since the 20s, and that means the, the, um, uh, a diminishing role of the, the um, breadwinner in the family, that means the male figure, and that is weakening yeah, and depending on uh, an, an outside uh, led um, authority, authority you know, because they are too weak to, to find from inside a perspective to control their own drives. You know, this is, this is basically the argument. So, yeah, and for them, you know, for, for, for Adorno and Horkheimer, th this makes it pop possible to, to equalize or to see the cultural industry in the United States and the Nazi regime and also the Stalinist regime as something what is more or less operates very similar. Yeah? So because all, all these regimes are um, steering the individuals in the same, in the same direction. You don't. Yeah. 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 Not for them. It's not a, a, a question. Yeah. 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 Okay. And um, yes, I, 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 I propose to to hold to the to the concept of populism, and but I would. Of course, you know, this is the reason why I speak of authoritarian populism, to make a difference to liberal, um, liberal populism like Macron is practicing it, 
and uh, something like, how to say, a democratic popular um, uh, strategy of populism like Chavez or Evo Morales followed to, you know, because the aim of those guys was, of course, I mean, they were not very successful, and, and I have a lot of criticism about it, but the aim was to, find, to establish new forms of di different ways of direct democracy than in Switzerland or what maybe in Austria is meant by direct democracy. I mean, it was a kind of councils in the, in the city quarters and so on. So it's really a complete different strategy. But they are very consequent. The, the countries were very corrupt. Yeah, and they didn't take it very seriously what their own aims have been, you know. So and immediately after two or three years, I was in Bolivia to, to discuss with a lot of those people in the ministries, and for them it was very clear what they are experiencing. They themselves in the administration is a new class society, yeah, based on indigenous groups, you know. It's a completely... And turnover of the of the social structures in Bolivia, and because many of them took a lot of profit out of the extra, uh, extractive industries, you know, and so yeah. It, so my argument basically is that we have to we to to consider or to take into account the social processes in in that are the framework or the basis for for those uh, stra for populist strategies and then they inform each other how successful they can operate you know uh, so i i do think that maybe to, to quickly say something about Mary's question, that the, the framework that I presented, the distinction between contestatory populism and identity populism uh, uh, is something that, that gets uh, uh, repackaged differently in the works of, of, of different political scientists or social scientists, and that this has like an explanation capacity to, to reach out and, 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 and to explain certain forms of, of populism that have nothing to do with anti-immigration and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, so across various geographical area, but also across time, we can go back to the, the, the 1800s, the, the, the People's Party in the US, which was basically farmers claiming that, that financial elites and bankers in, in New York were, were able to control the price of grains and, and they were corrupted and against their interest of the real people, basically farmers. So this is the contestatory model, which is sort of a dyadic model, uh, the people versus like the financial elites. Whereas uh, uh, identity populism, takes this core and adds just one component, uh, uh, namely that there's a scapegoat uh, uh, and those are immigrants and they are sort of used as tools by, by the, the, the uh, uh, evil elite to, to undermine the, the cultural fabric of, of the country. And I think when you look at, at, at the works of Müde uh, 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 and Javerner Müller, also the, the theory can sort of map uh, uh, this distinction in the same way. Uh, uh, to answer uh, uh, Martin, uh, yeah, indeed. So, so in the long version, <laughs> I was planning to uh, uh, make a nuance at the end, sort of commenting uh, uh, on the fact that it, it's true that, that for nationalist movement in Greece and, and, and Italy, uh, uh, what they want is other European countries to do their share of the work, but the Visegrad countries uh, just don't want to... to, to, to uh, 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 to share the burdens of, of, of welcoming asylum seekers uh, uh, and migrants. So I don't think that they will find a way to get past this in a me in this meaningful way. However, when we look at, at how this uh, 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 um, convergence of different discourse uh, uh, can shape the EU's voice with regard to the rest of the world, as, as what happened in the negotiation of the Global Compact of, of Migration, and also their endorsement of, of the Global Compact on Refugees, then it can be the case that their interests are a bit more aligned in sort of defending the, the uh, uh, fortress Europe uh, uh, together. And I think this is something that, that happened in, in the case of the input of the EU in the Global Compact of Migration, where 
the, 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 the position that the EU presented and the kind of amendments that it made to, to the draft was not something about the European cosmopolitanism and human rights and so on and so forth. It's about national sovereignty and the duty to readmit for basically state of, 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 of the global south who are, are sending immigrants. Also, I'd like to, to say that I, I, we wrote this paper before hearing the very illuminating talk of, of Jean-Yves yesterday, who made a clear distinction between the, the identi identitarians, les identitaires, and, and the other nationalists uh, 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 in Europe by saying that the former are not really populist in the same sense. Uh, and this is something that, that uh, um, I, I, we didn't fully comprehend when we, when we, work, uh, uh, when we wrote our, our first paper, to be honest. And it seems that now I'm realizing that the examples of, of coordination and so on and so forth is something that it's much stronger in those small identitarian groups that, that, that like the big political well-established parties that are the main voice of, of identity populism in Europe. Uh, so, yeah, so perhaps uh, uh, Jean-Yves would have been critical of, of, our, uh, <laughs> or of, of our paper uh, for, for this reason. And, and that's something that, that we need to dig more and, and perhaps to uh, uh, refine our position, honestly. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And that concludes, that concludes our last session today. Thank you very much, Andre, Alex, and Francois, for this wonderful presentation. And to all of speakers today and yesterday for their wonderful presentations. Well, three days. But anyway, no. uh, so I, I would like to thank um, Andrea Sjöne for, um, for support. I'd like to thank the audience, all of you, for um, active participation and patience for three days. Uh, we, appre we are much appreciated. Thank you to the technical staff and to the Hotel Bensur for this wonderful venue. Please enjoy the lunch, which starts in a few minutes. And then please enjoy the beauty of Budapest as long as you can. And have a safe journey home. Thank you for coming. Goodbye. <laughs>